Righty. Well, we've hit nine o'clock. That is the witching hour for talking about diamondback terrapins. Uh, welcome to those of you who have made it so far. My name is Randy Chambers. I am affiliated somehow with the Mid-Atlantic Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. I have some title like representative or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. I'm uh, the director of the Keck Environmental Field Lab here at William and Mary. And our co-host this afternoon is Jonathan Winnick. And Jonathan, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. I'm, I'm John Winnick. I'm um, with the Marine Academy of Technology and Environmental Science. And we conducted an initiative here called Project Terrapin. And um, I'm one of those titles, I guess, like altered it <laughs> or something like that. But um, just a Terrapin researcher, enthusiasts and conservationists and look forward to uh, meeting with everybody in our region. Excellent. Um, we met actually here at the Mid-Atlantic Diamondback Terrapin Working Group, met here at William & Mary back in 2014 uh, on a very rainy couple of days that we had then. Our most recent Mid-Atlantic Terrapin meeting was in 2018 uh, in, in John Wenick's backyard <laughs> in New Jersey. And the most recent national meeting was in uh, 2019, and that was pre-pandemic. And the next national meeting will be in Athens, Georgia, um, sometime next fall. But today we're here virtually, <laughs> remotely, uh, but still working no less devotedly um, on the research and education and the conservation and management of diamondback terrapins in the mid-Atlantic region. We're geographically constrained uh, as the coastal states of New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia, but we routinely have and do have today contributors from Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, and the Carolinas. In addition, we have attendees today from other regional Diamondback Terrapin working groups. And so on behalf of John, my co-host, uh, we welcome you all. Uh, we've compiled a list of registered people and their emails and plan to distribute that list to everyone. If you do not want to share your email uh, um, contact, then put a note in the chat um, and uh, to me or directly to my email, and we'll make sure that you don't end up um, on that list. Um, also note that uh, we are recording today's meeting, so we'll have a copy of the presentations uh, for later viewing. And we have six talks today, no posters. We didn't wanna go through the technological issues associated with trying to present posters. The plan is to have speakers uh, present uh, and share their screens and present their talks. Uh, in the best of worlds, everything will work just great. But I think you all realize we do not live in the best of all worlds. And so technical glitches are going to happen. And so we ask that you um, um, accommodate us as best you can. Um, to maybe assist with bandwidth, uh, we ask that the audience stay muted, uh, uh, probably with your videos off as well. If you have any technical questions, my research assistant, Madeline Rainsel, will be monitoring and responding to the questions box and the chat if any uh, concerns arise. Talks and uh, the questions following the talks are scheduled for 15 minutes each, but since the session is plenary, we can be a little loose with that, with that timing. Nevertheless, we know you all have schedules to uh, uh, be accommodated, and so we'll try to keep as close to uh, the schedule as we can. Following all the talks, after those six talks, we'll take a short uh, five to 10 minute break for snacks and restrooms, and uh, then return for an open discussion of the talks and topics that are relevant to the Mid-Atlantic region and perhaps even nationally. Okay, we've given uh, time for people to connect, and it looks like we have Upwards of 35 folks so far in attendance, which is, which is really great for uh, one of these mid-Atlantic meetings. So I think without further ado, uh, Sean, I think we're ready for you for the uh, first presentation. Uh, Sean Sterrett from uh, Monmouth University and his co-authors, Rebecca Beersons and Rachel Katz are going to be talking about a title, 
evaluating the detection of diamondback terrapin from an unmanned aerial system using 3D printed models. Take it away, Sean. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? We can indeed. All right, let me get this shared maybe. Thought I had it. <clears throat> okay. Um, that. All right. Um, thank you all very much for being here, for having me. Thanks for putting this together. It's good to have uh, all the Terrapin people together. Uh, my name is Sean Sterrett. I'm a relatively new, uh, new to the Mid-Atlantic, new to the North, relatively new to the Northeast. I'm a professor, assistant professor from Monmouth University. Um, I do work on a lot of a lot of stuff related to herps, but especially turtles and salamanders. And I'm trying to get into the the terrapin game. So I'm excited to meet you all um, eventually. And I've, I've met a bunch of you already. So um, I'm going to talk about some stuff real quick that we've uh, we've just started doing. So we just started this summer uh, working on this experiment that I'm going to show you all. And um, it's work that was uh, kind of a, got a series of, of, of uh, drone research projects. And this is one of them that was uh, done primarily by um, Rebecca Burzens, who's, uh, who's on here as well. Uh, she's an undergraduate from Monmouth University. She's an awesome uh, budding researcher. And uh, this was her summer scholars uh, work uh, for the summer. So uh, I've got a a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a few introductory slides I don't need to spend a lot of time on because of the audience, but we know that turtles have declined across, um, across the globe. Uh, that, that goes uh, without saying for the United States as well. Um, several papers that have, have demonstrated this, uh, you know, turtles, we know that what most of the impacts are for terrapins, it's going to be roads. We know, unfortunately, over collection and poaching uh, habitat loss and alteration, crab pots, things like that. Um, I think we've got a, a number of state managers on this call, so you can, you can, they can certainly uh, email me, let me know if this isn't the truth, but I think state managers are worried about terrapins. There's a number of initiatives uh, that have been taken throughout the Northeast uh, to be thinking about all the impacts that are most critical for terrapin populations. Um, like again, crabbing, roads, uh, you know, these big uh, known poaching events, uh, this gentleman from Pennsylvania coming to the Jersey coast and taking a bunch of animals, um, things like that. So uh, the big problem with terrapins and probably all turtles and many of the other animals that I work with at least is that um, to estimate terrapin populations and the dynamics of populations requires typically many years of traditional um, capture marker capture data um, traditionally, and even the, even then, we have low confidence in those estimates. So, you know, my thought here is, uh, can we perhaps introduce new methods that could help us think about um, how populations change, trends, et, et cetera? And so that's kind of where the drone work has come from, for me at least. Um, this work for me started in 2018 at the Northeast Diamondback Terrapin Working Group meeting. Uh, this is Wellfleet Bay. We were out on a field trip and we were out doing uh, some folks had caught some some turtles and we were going to talk about, you know, working up terrapins and some standard methods. And we were all looking out into the bay and, and this is what you see. And for this was this was news to me at the time, but uh, for terrapin mm -hmm. people, this is pretty common. Um, this is a big seasonal aggregation of, of terrapins. And if you look at this, um, you can see all the all the heads sticking out of the water. And I said, wow, okay, seasonal mating aggregations are new to me. They're uh, documented pretty well in the, the uh, Rosenberg and, and Kennedy book. Um, and I was just really curious about being able to try to fly a drone over, over these terrapins. And if, if there was a way to try to sample uh, populations using drones. So I uh, went out, I got a drone. Uh, I got a license, which took some time, and then I went out uh, in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and started to do uh, drone image collection. Turns out we can do this really easily. Terrapins are easily observed from a drone. Um, this image isn't easy to see, but if I point out the, the terrapins to you, you can, you can see them there, and you'd have to zoom in a little bit to try to actually see what you're looking at. The terrapins, left out of license. Ter terrapins are easily observed from a drone. 
we can see them, we can count them, we think that we can measure them and trying to start some work soon to, to do that. In some cases, we can determine sex. Like 30 heads up in the water. We can determine sex of, of uh, terrapins and we can even see them underwater. And so the question came uh, to me, I wanted to know what is the detection of terrapins from a drone? And I wanted to know if we take images from a drone, can, can observers accurately count terrapins from drone images? So um, the idea here is that because we don't know how the drone influences terrapin behavior, we'd like to try to maximize the distance of the drone from the terrapins, but we'd also like to minimize the distance uh, from the drone from the terrapin so that we can increase our detection. So because terrapins don't necessarily sit still when you ask them to, I decided to take this from an experimental approach using 3D models. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, that process. Um, we did develop a 3D model of a terrapin uh, with help from a, a 3D printing expert at Monmouth University. We took a, a shell that was uh, from Georgia that I'd collected a decade ago, and uh, we turned that into a 3D model. We printed those models. This is uh, the prototype here uh, of what this looks like. We printed them in three biologically relevant sizes, a uh, large female, uh, a large male, and a juvenile, with which I'll, I'll refer to them as, as large, medium, and small <clears throat> for the rest of the talk. I had an amazing, very creative and artistic student who worked with me last summer, uh, who was able to, to actually um, paint them to make them look like their, their terrapins. And this is the, one of the large, um, large terrapin uh, uh, prints with it being uh, uh, painted there. And so we have uh, our experimental subjects. Um, we have uh, 40 small, 40 medium, and then seven large, although it's showing six there. All right, so we were doing this, uh, we did an experimental drone trial uh, setup, and, and these drone trials consisted of um, randomly selecting numbers of small, medium, and large terrapins <clears throat> in one to 20 groupings. So what that means was that we had 20 groups of terrapins that were randomly selected for a certain number of small, medium, and large in those groupings. One at a time, uh, one of these groupings was placed in an aquatic arena. This is what uh, Rebecca did this summer uh, when we went out to do drone trials. She would set those, uh, those, drone, or those 3D models out into an arena that was roughly 10 to 20 meters wide. Um, big enough so that I could capture uh, images of these things um, at the lowest level. The drone was centered on the arena. Images were taken from uh, 18 to 60 meters in three meter intervals. Trials that we did were performed in two different habitats. I'm not going to talk much about this, but we did do this in two different habitats that represented simple, which meant open water, really nothing floating at the surface and complex habitat, which is where you had lots of algae, um, uh, things like that that could potentially be a, a influencer on, on being able to count these things accurately. All images that were taken were assigned a unique ID. Images were randomly selected and then provided to independent observers. So far we only have eight observers, but we are working on increasing that number uh, through the fall and spring. Observers were given a protocol uh, that Rebecca put, came up with for, um, for what to do with the images. So to tell them uh, what they needed to do with the image. Um, observers were not given any information about how many were out in the water or the height at which they were taken. Um, observers labeled the terrapins based on size using ITAG. So they, there's this free uh, program, which we kind of like, kind of don't like, but we used it so far in which observers can take an image and actually put different colors on that image to be able to quantify the number of, of different size of turtles. And we're only gonna report on terrapin size and height today. Um, this is brand new stuff. So um, just keep in mind that this is very preliminary and I thought I'd give this, take this opportunity to get the get this stuff out here uh, while, while I've got the, the chance. Okay. So here's, here's a little bit of the re results that we've got so far. 
Um, I'm going to show you a series of three of these uh, these comparable uh, graphs. Um, this is a height on the x-axis and deviation from the truth for the large uh, terrapin. And um, zero represents uh, completely accurately counting uh, terrapins. And anything below the line we think of as an undercount, and anything above the line is an overcount. And relative to the medium and, and small terrapins, uh, our observers did a pretty good job of counting large terrapins. As you move um, to the higher from 60 feet, this is in feet instead of meters, from feet to uh, 200 feet, um, you do see a slight decrease in the ability to accurately count these uh, larger terrapins. Um, but that's, this is relatively good. We don't really know what these, um, these overcounts, these dots in the, um, towards the left side of the graph above the zero. Don't really know what those mean yet, but uh, hopefully we'll figure that one out. As you move to the medium terrapins, um, you see that these dots start to uh, kind of go all, all over the place and we start to see um, more undercounting of, of medium sized terrapins. So uh, you start to see undercounting at both the, the lower heights and the upper heights. Uh, we think this probably has to do with a number of things. One, it's harder to count terrapins accurately at higher, um, at, at higher uh, drone image heights, uh, but also it might be possible that they're, they're seeing things, they're counting things that aren't there or they're, they're simply challenged uh, to count um, terrapins. Um, as we move to the small size, you start to see these dots kind of go all over the place. And we do see a, 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 you know, a slight trend in, in decreasing from 60 feet to 200 feet. Um, no surprise here, it's, it's harder to see these teeny tiny turtles um, at these higher heights. Uh, but as you move, I'll just flip back through here from large to medium to small, we start to see that it's, it's more challenging to see the small turtles than it is to see the large turtles. Um, this is, uh, this experiment kind of gave us a unique opportunity in any wildlife ecology study, uh, to actually look at true detection probability, because we knew exactly how many animals were out there, animals in quotes here that were out in the water. And so we can see here that detection probability of terrapins is somewhere between one and zero, although there are dots above the, the one line here. So one for detection probability represents uh, absolute perfect detection. That means that if the animal is there, you're going to have a 100% chance of seeing it. Um, that isn't even true for things like elephants on savannas. So um, in the wildlife ecology world, detection is never one. It's always, it's almost always less than one. And so we can see it's no different for terrapins, even plastic terrapins floating in water. Um, but what we can see here is a slight negative trend, uh, again, very preliminary, uh, going from 60 feet to 200 feet. And so we do see this, um, it does get harder uh, to detect. Detection does go down as you move towards uh, higher drone images. Okay, so what did we learn in our first summer of doing this? Um, so observers ability to accurately count 3D model terrapins was influenced by very unshockingly height of image and size of turtle. The height of the image influenced the ability for observers to, to count turtles. Um, that was our, our hypothesis, which is supported here and hopefully further in the uh, more, more so in the future. Size of turtle also mattered, or we think it mattered. Um, and so height and size were, were something we're, we're directly interested in, in, uh, in looking at. Uh, glare and surficial debris, we think, are, are major issues. Glare, uh, which is the sunlight kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of coming off the water in a particular way is, is a challenge for drone images. It's a very common talked about thing in, um, in images that are taken from drones. And so we think that that's a problem that'll have to be taken into account when you're, when you're planning uh, drone projects. Surficial debris, especially in complex habitats, is a, is a problem. In our case, duckweed and, uh, and algae and other things floating the surface influence the ability for, for observers, we think, to, um, 
to count things, to count terrapins accurately. We also think the observer matters. There was a lot of variation between observers. And so the observer um, matters. We're hoping to get a little bit, get into that data a little bit more um, in the future once we have more observers. Over and under counting are issues. So under counting probably means that they didn't see terrapins that were there. And overcounting was that they were making up things that were not there. Um, probably uh, glare. If I were to show you some images of some images, or show you some images with with lots of glare, you'd see that they there are places where it looks like it's a it's a round terrapin. So that's a problem. Um, observers' ability to characterize turtle size is also questionable, and we're curious. We're we're going to look a little bit more into that, but uh, based on the the basic protocol that Rebecca gave out to observers, um, you know, we think that we gave them enough information to be able to determine if something's large, medium, or small. But as you can imagine, a naive observer going into this might be challenged uh, to, to tell the difference between uh, large, medium, and small. So this is new work. We're hoping to get more observers, perhaps doing some more work in the future, similar experiments. But one of our curiosities is, is, can a computer more accurately count terrapins? And so one of the things we're trying to do is develop classification models um, for being able to develop classification models to identify terrapins in the water. We have had some challenges there. Um, it just so happens that it's, it's just based on color alone, it's hard for a classification model to pick terrapins out from the background water. Uh, we're still working on that a bit and hopefully Rebecca is um, on board to help me with that in the future. That's it. Um, again, very basic, uh, very new stuff for me and, uh, and my lab and Rebecca. And so, um, you know, a bunch of people to thank here from the funding to the 3D model developing study design, painting shells, and one of our professors at Monmouth who allowed us to use his farm pond for one of our, our, uh, our sites. So be happy to, to answer any questions and uh, by email or here. And uh, thanks for having me. All right. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and, and, and uh, ask, ask away. I, I know uh, Thanet was asking about uh, what do you have an identification of what the optimal flight altitude would be for identifying terrapins? Yeah, that's the that's the hopes. Um, we don't. I don't think we have enough uh, data yet to to make that uh, to to make a solid recommendation. <laughs> trying to get there, but um, you know, in in my my experience doing this in a couple of different locations. I think we still don't know how, how drones influence terrapin behavior. From my experience, down to 60 feet, uh, 18 meters, we don't, I didn't see any effects of the drone on terrapin diving behavior, anything like that. I think some other people um, have, have said that as well. As far as being able to detect them, 60 feet, you can see anything. I think with terrapins from a standard drone. The other thing I didn't say is that I'm using a standard uh, DJI Phantom 4 Pro drone. It's the most common, one of the most common drones on the market. And so with that camera, with that drone, you can see, see most everything at 60 feet. So, so I'll put out 60 feet right now with a caveat that I think we need more, more research on that. Hey, um, so I know that in box turtles, they've used uh, shell identification, like photo identification to find individuals. Do you think you were getting clear enough photos that you could use this to actually track individuals in populations or even like count scoot annuli and tell age at a more specific um, resolution? Uh, no. I don't think so. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's possible. So this work was presented by Rebecca at Knee Park uh, last week. I can't remember week before last week. Time is nothing to me right now. But we had a conversation on the side about. Um, <laughs> I think it's with Brian Zarati who's who's on here that maybe we could 
bring in the CIA to increase our, uh, uh, our improve our cameras so that we can get that resolution. Um, I don't think with what we've got right now on the standard drone market that we have that ability, but there are some, there are, you can get bigger drones with much higher resolution cameras. So that's quite possible. Um, I think it's possible. I'll say it's possible ish, uh, perhaps with, uh, with some of the, some of the technology that's on the market now. Great. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? One of the things I was wondering, Sean, was uh, I was talking to John about this, was using drones for other aerial detection. And, and one of the things I was interested in was commercial crab pot floats and, you know, your ability to fly some of these tidal creeks and be able to actually get a number of, you know, what that crabbing intensity is in some of these places. Yeah, I would say that's totally in bounds. I think it's quite possible. You know, the one thing I didn't emphasize here with the, I didn't emphasize the real Terrapin drone images. We can see them underwater. We don't really pretty easily. I don't know the depth and that's something we're going to experiment with. So I think it's quite possible to see crab pots that are either emergent or submergent uh, in some of the tidal creeks. Cool. Yep. All right. All right. All right. Thanks very much, Sean. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, our next speaker actually is, is two speakers. Um, it's a tag team presentation by a couple of undergraduates here from William & Mary. It's Michael Gibson and Natalie Klesch. And the title of their talk is A Novel Bycatch Reduction Device to Promote Terrapin Conservation in the Blue Crab Fishery. So take it away. I guess Michael's first, is that right? Share your screen, Michael. I mute myself first too. Very good. All right, so as Professor Chambers said, our presentation is called a novel bycatch reduction device promoting terrapin conservation in the in the blue crab fishery. I'm Michael Gibson, and presenting with me will be Natalie Klesch. This research was also aided by Madeline Reinsel and Dr. Randy Chambers. And we are working here at the, at the Keck lab at the, I guess they wanted to call it a university now, but the College of William and Mary. And um, the purpose of this research was to, as the title says, develop a, a new kind of bycatch reduction device um, which has an oval design against currently used rectangular models. There we go. So the main reason that we decided to go through with this research is um, the occurrence of BRD regulations across the East Coast, uh, specifically for diamondback terrapins and a few other things. So currently Virginia does not have any BRD regulations for any crab pots, whether commercial or recreational. And as you can see up in the upper right-hand part of the screen, um, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, New York, South Carolina, and North Carolina all have various BRD models um, New Jersey having the two inch rectangular model, um, Maryland, Delaware, and New York having one and three quarters rectangle, and then South Carolina, North Carolina having that little, little square shaped one. Um, one of the key reasons why we're also doing this study here is because many states want to have studies done locally. They want to have data that BRDs work in their own environments, as opposed to studies that come from elsewhere saying that BRDs are effective, because we do almost unequivocally know that BRDs are effective in keeping terrapins out of crab traps, but local, local governments want to have data from their state before implementing any kind of regulations.
Hello, as Michael already introduced me, I'm Natalie. Um, and now I'm gonna be um, going over essentially um, the basic experimental design of um, our research. So we had two field sites, Bellgates Creek and Indian Field Creek, um, which are tidal inlets off of the York River located on the Yorktown Naval Weapons Station. Um, in our experiment, we had five different treatment groups. Obviously we had our experimental oval models. We had a two inch oval model, a one and three quarter inch oval model, um, which we did, then tested against the two inch rectangular model and the one and three quarter inch rectangular model. And then of course, we also had our control pots, which we used as a point of comparison. Um, we had a total of 40 traps. We had 20 traps at each site. Um, and each site we set up our traps in um, lines of five, um, one um, pot from each treatment group were, was placed within the line. And these pots were placed um, essentially randomly um, in accordance to order um, within the line itself. Um, and we baited our crab pots every other day. And so each day we'd head out in our canoes and we would check our traps for terrapins and blue crabs. We would measure our terrapins for their shell length, the width and the height. And our blue crabs were measured um, for carapith width. Uh, you can see here a little bit more clearly a view of our research sites. So over here we had Felgates Creek on the left. Um, you can sort of see um, these little red dots are the relative placement of our crab pots. And over on the right, you can see Indian Field Creek. Um, these pots were sort of arranged in lines as well. Um, you can see that our sites was right, right off the York River, which flows into the Chesapeake Bay, um, a huge terrapin habitat. Um, so we were really right in the heart of it all. And now we just have a, a couple photos to show y'all what we did on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, over here on the left, you can see Michael um, pulling up on one of our crab pots. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that we did have these little wire chimneys attached to the top of the pots. So um, terrapins, which ended up being captured, um, usually in control pots, were able to reach the surface and breathe. And then over on the right, you can just sort of see me pulling up a trap, um, pulling out the crabs. And that's just to give everyone an idea of where we were, what we were doing. Here we just have a few more photos. Um, here we are at Indian Field Creek, our other site. Um, you could see it gets pretty muddy sometimes. We had some low tide days. On the right, you could see- Keep recording. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> On the right, you can see we had a blue crab um, and we would measure them from spine to spine um, to figure out if they were legal or not. So the summary of our results is we ended up having 784 trap nights, which is essentially uh, give or take 24 hours in which the crab traps were closed and catching either crabs or terrapins. We ended up catching 214 terrapins, 162 of those ended up being in control pots. And the catch per unit effort for terps and in all of the traps was 0.28 plus 0.04 standard error. We only had 502 legal crabs. This was a very, very bad year for the blue crab catch in the Chesapeake Bay across the board. Um, and 86% of all of our pots contained either zero or one legal crab. So ended up having less than one on average per pot. So uh, if we were trying to be commercial crabbers, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have survived. <laughs> uh, only 5% of our pots had one legal crab and one terrapin, which is kind of interesting. So these are some of our results, bycatch versus crab catch. We used an analysis of variance, a NOVA test uh, to compare all of these results. So we have two graphs here, of CPUE for terrapins and for uh, large legal crabs. So as we can see, um, the Virginia reg regulation on BRDs, which doesn't exist, so this is our control group, um, catches much more and significantly more terrapins than any of the other um, either two inch BRD designs or one and three quarter inch designs. But 
at the same time, both the two inch designs um, catch significantly more than the one and three quarter designs. And it doesn't really matter whether or not they ended up being rectangular designs or our novel oval designs. Um, what really mattered here was the size of the BRDs. Um, and at the same time, what is most important to you know, commercial crabbers and recreational crabbers, and even more importantly, legislators who might implement a BRD regulation in our state, is that there wasn't really a significant decrease in crab catch um, due to implementation of BRDs. The only significant decrease there really was was between control, so no BRD, and the one and three quarter oval, but even then it's not, not a whole lot. So at the same time, we also found no significant difference in the size of the already legal crabs that were caught in any of the treatment groups in the study. Because um, of course, crabbers are most concerned with um, you know, the number of economically valuable crabs that they're able to catch. So we didn't find that um, the size of the crabs that were caught were decreased in any of the pots. And as we saw in the last slide, the number wasn't significantly decreased either after using BRDs. Okay, um, so now we're gonna be taking a closer look at some of our terrapin data, um, specifically our terrapin bycatch rates. Um, so if you take a look on this histogram on the left over here, you'll see along the x-axis, we plotted the number of terrapins trapped and along the y-axis, we plotted the frequency. Um, so for instance, we um, had one terrapin captured in a pot and we had that occur 57 different times, which ultimately accounted for 27% of our total captures. So 57 of 214 total captures were um, individual terrapins in pots. And, um, you know, I would say, think that um, your average crabber might think that one or two terrapins in a pot may not be that big of a deal. Um, but as you can see, over time, one or two terrapins in a pot began to add up. And ultimately, it ac accounted for about 47% or almost half of our total captures were just um, one or two terrapins in a pot at a time. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, however, we also had these mass capture events occur. Um, in which we had two separate occasions in which there were 17 terrapins all stuck in one control pot. And like I said, this happened on two separate occasions at two different sites. Um, and these events are really dangerous because in commercial setting, you know, you can imagine the results would have been disastrous. It would have led to mass terrapin mortality. Um, thankfully, in our case, we did have chimneys on the pots. Um, but overall, um, without the use of BRDs, um, these events can really be detrimental to our local environments and inlets, the terrapin populations. Um, thankfully though, the BRDs do prevent bycatch, as we all know, um, significantly more terps were caught in traps without the BRDs. Um, so our control pots, obviously, as Michael already stated, ended up having a lot more of um, catching a lot more terrapins. Um, but uh, if you take a look at this graph over here, you can see we plotted the, um, the, the shell width versus um, shell height for our um, group of captured terrapins. And you can see um, along the, um, I've also included the um, width of the BRDs along this graph, um, the two inch BRDs um, will exclude any terrapins with a shell height of 5.1 centimeters or greater, and the 1.75 inch um, BRDs would exclude any terrapins with a shell height of 4.5 centimeters um, or greater. So if, say, all of our um, traps had had the two inch BRDs, you can see a lot fewer terrapins would have been captured um, in our experiment, and an even smaller number of terrapins would have been captured if one and three quarter inch BRDs had been applied to all the traps in our, um, in our research. So overall, what we found is that it wasn't necessarily the shape of the BRD, which made the difference, but the size. The, um, the, 1, .3, the one and three quarter inch BRDs we found were overall um, 
very effective in our area in the Chesapeake Bay. I think we only had about um, five terrapins caught in our one and three quarter inch um, BRDs um, all um, our, during our entire project. And so, um, yeah, as I said, what we found was that overall size matters for um, our BRDs. So although our oval model um, did not end up being necessarily more or less effective than our rectangular models, um, it didn't really necessarily capture any more crabs or exclude any more terrapins. Um, we do have hope that it will be very useful in the future because it's a lot easier to install into our um, crab pots um, because of, just because of its shape. Um, the oval fits really well into the entryway and Michael and I, had to put about 128 BRDs into traps at the beginning of our experiment. And it was a lot easier to install the ovals. Um, you didn't really get scratched up by the wires as much. It just went a lot faster. And so we hope that in the future, these oval BRDs will play a role um, in recreational nearshore crabbing in Virginia. Um, just because they're a lot more appealing to crabbers, they fit in the traps and they're simpler to use. Uh, that's all we really had to say. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a really great opportunity for Michael and I, um, really our first chance to get some biology field work experience, and we had a lot of fun. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Natalie. That was great. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, Sean has a question already. Oh, sorry. No question. I'm just clapping. Oh, you're clapping. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right. He wasn't yeah, that, raising that, his hand. He's clapping. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was a fun presentation. Thanks. There you go. Yeah. This, this is Thane Wibbles. I have a question from University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, what, do you have any speculation as to why you got those mass capture events periodically? Um, yes, we do think that it happened because, well, both of the events did happen towards the beginning of our experiment. So the terrapins, you know, they're very curious. Um, they were kind of exploring the new traps in their environments. Um, and so I think, you know, they, they see one of their um, comrades go into the trap and then they all end up following along behind. And, um, you know, over time, the terrapins, they do generally learn, um, oh, I shouldn't go into there. I'm gonna get, end up getting stuck in there. Um, but unfortunately, in a commercial setting, that wouldn't have been the case because the terrapins would have likely drowned and they wouldn't have had that second chance to figure out, oh, I shouldn't go in these traps. Um, so yeah, we essentially think it happened because they were curious and terrapins will sort of follow the leader in that aspect. To add on to that a little bit, um, this wasn't a population study. We probably did, still did end up capturing the same terrapins multiple times over in this experiment. Hi, I, I have a question. Go ahead, Marguerite. Hi, I, I just, um, I had a few uh, questions re and I, I had to, I lost connection there for briefly, so you may have covered this, but um, who at the state level had a prop, you know, what is the main target or the main audience that has uh, objections to the BRD? Um, Basically, anyone doing crabbing, um, largely, yeah, for kind of obvious reasons. A lot of people are hesitant because they think, you know, putting something over the entryway of their, their crab trap is going to reduce the crab catch, which is understandable. And it's also extra work that they would have to do, you know, installing these things. Um, right. uh, but... I don't know if I should get into who exactly we should. I, I, I'm willing to, to take on a little bit of that in that the, the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, Margaret, is responsible for establishing what the regulations are. And they have a subcommittee, a crabbing subcommittee, that includes a number of commercial and recreational crabbers on the committee. And so that committee yep. is, is fairly heavily weighted toward uh, folks that are a little bit disinterested in, in having an additional bycatch reduction sure. device imposed upon them. Let me throw out, because we had the same account. I, I worked with uh, Maryland Fisheries when right. we had the 
BRD requirement there uh, in 1999. And I consulted with a lot of watermen. And of course, for the most part in Maryland, the, the commercial watermen are not going to be affected because they can't put their pots in shallow water right. anyway. So our uh, requirement was directed towards um, waterfront property owners who are allowed to set two pots. And a lot of times these are in tributaries that are just, you know, uh, flushed with terrapins. But um Anyway, one of, we had a waterman testify at our hearing in that his belief was when you restrict the funnel, you actually help retain the number of crabs because crabs will come, and I think this has been borne out in, in other research, but crabs will come and go in a pot. And you're using the pot with the two chambers. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so they will, you need to get them up in the up, upper church in order to retain them. Unless they go up there, they're going to float in and out uh, of the funnels. That, that was what this waterman uh, testified to. And that when you control the shape and you restrict the entrance, it actually improves your crab catch overall. That was his message. Um, and that leads me to my, the other question in that he also believed that if you have a terrapin in the pot, crabs won't go in there. So unless you're checking it, I don't know if that was borne out in your research. Um, for example, if you, in, in your control pots where you had a terrapin or several, what was the ratio of crabs that entered that pot? Well, on one of, on one of our slides before, we did say that only 5% of the pots had at least one terrapin and at least one um, legal size crab anyways. Um, uh -huh. I'm not sure what the data said in terms of like how many crabs would end up being in control pots with their, when there's a bunch of terrapins in there as well. Yeah, that was one of the things we mentioned as a benefit to the BRD. I don't have any data on that. Right. But um, crabs will be repelled or whatever. Uh, the other the other thing that made sense to me is that a crab, when it's hungry, is very determined. So they'll get in the pot. That's not that's not a worry. And um, when they're getting out, you know, they're not as determined, maybe. Hmm. Um, we also have a coal ring at the top chamber. Sure. I, I don't know if you require we, that as well i don't we do. i don't really i don't know how much that it may help with hatchlings escape to right. escape but um margaret okay. we're gonna margaret we're gonna uh, try to stay a little bit on schedule and these are great questions for discussion at the end uh -huh. um, so so we'll probably end up talking about this a little bit more after the presentations okay good Thanks. thank you michael could you unshare your screen yep all right uh, our next speaker uh, is Brian Williamson from uh, the Wetlands Institute in Stone Harbor. And his co-authors are Zachary Holmes and Lisa Ferguson. And Brian's going to talk about understanding spatial and temporal trends in diamondback terrapin mortality on Cape May County roadways. Hi, Brian, and take it away. Hi, let me get my screen shared here. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Brian Williamson. I'm a research scientist at the Wetlands Institute um, in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've been doing to understand spatial and temporal trends in road mortality risk um, for diamondback terrapins. So before I get into it, I just want to thank everyone who's helped us out with this work. Um, it's been a lot, of, uh, <laughs> a lot of people over the years and a lot of organization. Um, to really get everything going. So it really would not have been possible without everyone's assistance. Um, so everyone here pretty much knows that roads are a persistent threat to terrapin populations. Um, the loss and fragmentation of natural nesting habitat has led to terrapins nesting along roadsides and in developed areas. Um, sorry, moving that screen out of the way. Um, and causeways in New Jersey are 
one of the main areas where we see this problem. Um, we have these roads that basically bisect the salt marsh. They connect the barrier islands to the mainland, and they are surrounded by upland habitat that's very accessible for terrapins and serves as tempting nesting habitat in areas where there really is very little nesting habitat otherwise. Um, unfortunately, they're also very seasonally high traffic roads, uh, so we end up losing quite a bit of terrapins on these roadways. And since 1989, the Wetlands Institute has been working to understand and mitigate this issue. We found that an average of 500 terrapins are lost annually on a 38 mile transect, basically from uh, where we are um, up to Ocean City, New Jersey. So consistent mortality of this level might pose a risk to this long-lived species. And it's important as a result of that to understand the periods and locations of high crossing activity so we can improve our conservation efforts focused on diamondback terrapins. So to that end, uh, we worked to uh, do some focused surveys of a smaller section of a road patrol transect. Uh, we chose a 4.9 kilometer causeway, which is, as I mentioned, a portion of our larger transect. It's bordered on both sides by a thin band of upland habitat and surrounded on all sides by salt marsh. There are several developed areas along the roadway, as well as some mitigation fencing that was installed to reduce terrapin crossings um, in areas of high crossing activity. Uh, there's also bulkheading that's present, um, mainly on the south side of the roadway, um, which likely influences uh, terrapin crossing activity as well. To survey this road, we drove it five times per day during the nesting season from May through July 2017 uh, through 2020. And every time we encountered a terrapin, either dead or alive um, or injured, we recorded its GPS location and its status and assisted it across in the direction that it was headed if alive. Um, for every encounter, we recorded the cloud cover based on field conditions at the time, uh, the date and the time as well. And for any dead terrapins we found, we recorded the carcass condition. Um, which we used to kind of get a sense of how long the carcass had been on the roadway. Uh, carcasses that were dry and flat, um, those tended to be ones that we um, assumed had been on the road for quite some time. We also recorded prior day precipitation from local weather stations and any injured and or dead terrapins were merged as casualties for the sake of analysis. So when I show you these summary stats in a second, you'll see that we just have live and casualty. Um, over the course of 1,254 surveys that we conducted over the four years, we encountered 1,065 terrapins, um, 315 live terrapins, and 750 uh, casualties, so either injured or dead terrapins. So um, definitely no small number. To analyze the uh, spatial characteristics of this crossing activity, we used a program called Siriema, um, which is used to um, study uh, wildlife road mortality and road crossing activity. Uh, it's basically specially designed for that purpose. Um, before we could actually run the analysis, we needed to remove any outliers. Um, so we went through, looked at our data, and found that there were 23 points that basically we just had GPS error greater than 30 meters. So we took those out before we went ahead. And then we used um, the Ripley's case statistic tool in Siriema to assess whether there was significant clustering or dispersion of crossing activities or mortality uh, or casualties, I should say, um, along the road and at what scales that occurred. So this works by summing the number of events. Uh, so in this case, it would be crossings or casualties within a 30 meter radius. And we could set that radius to wherever we wanted. Uh, we chose 30 based on the scale of our roadway. And then multiplied by a correction factor to account for the road length. This is then repeated again and again at larger scales until the radius equals uh, the length of the road um, to get a sense of you know, the existence of clustering or dispersion at multiple scales. Once we determined whether or not there was clustering or dispersion, which surprise there was significant clustering or dispersion, uh, we used 2D hotspot analysis in Siriema to identify where that occurred. So we divided the road into 150 segments um, and then passed a 30 meter radius circle over each event, summing all the events in the circle to uh, better understand where these uh, clustering and dispersion events occurred. Um, so we did this for both total crossings and casualties, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna be going over the results for crossings because we had a much larger sample size um, and the trends between the two um, that we saw were basically the same. So these are the results of our um, hotspot analysis. Um, you can see anything in warm colors uh, is a hotspot. Um, 
with yellow being lower intensity and red being the higher intensity. And the highest intensity hotspots tend to occur towards the eastern end of the roadway near an area where we have um, very uh, high use terrapin nesting habitat. Um, also, there's a gap in the fence in this area as well. You can see in the area where there are those red hotspots, uh, those high intensity hotspots, there's actually a gap in that fence. So uh, it's possible the terrapins are being funneled into that area as they cross uh, to seek nesting habitat. Unfortunately, the gap must exist due to intersections in that area. So we really don't have much we can do about that. Um, you can also see that around areas in the gaps of fencing, we did tend to have these uh, hotspots. So it's possible that that's um, part of the, the problem is that terrapins are entering the road and becoming trapped in the fence section. We have cold spots as well that occurred within these uh, fenced areas, but um, it, you know, so it is possible the fence is making a difference. Um, this is an area where we already had a lot of nesting activity, so this could be worse without the fence. Uh, it is kind of hard to say. But if you look towards the western end of the road, we have uh, several cold spots, and those tend to be in areas where there's bulkheading. So to get a sense of when um, these uh, you know, crossing events are most likely to occur, uh, we did some temporal and environmental analysis to see what factors influence crossings. Um, we had reliable time data for 549 of our terrapin encounters. We removed all dry carcasses from analysis. And we divided our patrol window into five two-hour time classes within the 0800 to 1800 hour survey window. Uh, we scaled the total number of encounters uh, by the number of survey passes during each time class just to account for effort. There were some times where you know, we may have needed to drive the road multiple times, and so we had to take that into account. You can see our time classes here on the right. So to analyze this data, we used a generalized linear model uh, with the Poisson distribution and log length function in JMP uh, with a combination of fixed effects and uh, two-way interactions of those fixed effects and a backward selection approach to reach our final model. Our final model suggested that tide stage was the only significant main effect that influenced terrapin crossing activity. So during high and falling tides, terrapins were significantly more likely to be encountered. Um, this really shouldn't be too surprising. Um, but it does suggest, you know, it does give us uh, concrete evidence that those times are when crossing activity is most likely. We found that cloud cover and time uh, affected um, terrapin activity and actually interacted to affect terrapin activity. Um, in general, there was a significant increase in the likelihood of crossing activity in the late morning by 55% and in early afternoon by 44%. Uh, in general, it was 23% less likely during the mid-afternoon. And cloudy conditions overall uh, reduced crossing activity by 26%, so over all time classes, um, whereas partly cloudy conditions comparatively increased the early and mid-afternoon activity. Um, however, in clear days, uh, we had you know, our highest activity in the late morning. So it seems like the presence of cloudy weather um, kind of basically uh, pushes back terrapin activity during the day, um, possibly due to changes in temperature, which we'll talk a little about. So some conclusions from this, um, high falling tides in the early afternoon during partly cloudy weather um, lead to the highest crossing probability. Um, this is likely a result of the fact that nesting during high tides allows easier access to nesting areas and improves likelihood of nest success, less likely for a nest to flood if it's high above the, the tide mark and it's easier to get there if the tide's pretty high to begin with. This also supports a lot of what we already know about terrapin um, nesting ecology and the work, the influence of tide on nesting um, attempts. The timing of peak crossing activity in our study shifted earlier during clear conditions and was reduced during periods of high cloud cover. And this suggests a possible role of temperature in determining the optimal nesting conditions. Um, optimal temperatures may be reached earlier in the day with lower cloud cover and may be less likely to occur at all during cloudy conditions. When we go back to our spatial data, it does look like gaps in the fencing for driveways and intersections may be compromising the effectiveness of our fence. Um, there are several other studies that suggest that gaps in wildlife mitigation fencing can lead to hotspots and an increase in the number of animals that are on the road over baseline. Um, and we have those gaps as a result, not only of driveways and intersections, but damaged sections of fence that occur throughout the year and vegetation that can grow over the fence. Um, it's also important when we look at our spatial results that 
we remember that fencing was installed in these locations for a reason, because there was already a lot of terrapin crossing activity. So it's likely that these hotspots may have been a lot worse, um, a lot hotter, <laughs> so to say, um, if this fence was, was not present. Um, but it does suggest perhaps there's some problems with our fencing, which we can uh, work on. Urbanized areas may correspond with gaps in the fencing, which can lead to a higher risk of crossing, but also we may have a higher risk of mortality due to traffic from those um, intersections and driveways um, in those areas. Uh, so we really need to do some continued work to better understand the role of these features. We weren't really able to analyze it in a quantitative way, um, but we're hoping to be able to in the future. So just some final uh, conservation implications and some future work. Um, fencing in general, our results suggest cannot solve the issue of mortality if it is not continuous. Um, when we look at our spatial data, we have fencing in our areas where, in areas where there are hotspots already. Um, and so we really don't need additional fencing at our study site. Um, however, it does suggest that perhaps our current fencing can be improved. Um, it's really important when you in install fencing that you consider road mortality as a permanent long-term issue. And so any fencing you install needs to be durable um, and needs to be something that can remain there for the life of the roadway. These are permanent fixtures in our landscape, and so we need permanent solutions to the problem. Um, dynamic signage can help in areas where gaps are impossible to avoid. Um, and outreach and direct rescue of terrapins should be something that we continue to help reduce the impacts of roads on um, terrapin populations. If you are surveying to reduce, um, to directly rescue terrapins, uh, we should survey at high tides in the mid morning and the early afternoon based on the weather for maximum conservation impact. And the level of mortality that we observed may impact the population. Um, it is a persistent issue and it's going to require continued monitoring and study for us to better understand, uh, but we are doing what we can to, to get there. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions if there's time. All right. Thank you, Brian. No problem. Uh, Scott uh, Smith had the question of whether or not in some of these hotspot areas for crossing, whether you could provide alternate nesting habitat in those areas that might keep the turtles from crossing in those places. Yeah, so um, that is something that we're considering doing on this roadway. Um, in some areas, it's very difficult because there's not a lot of space on the shoulder for that kind of habitat. Um, but there are places where we can work with homeowners and local communities to get something like that installed, um, especially in the area um, towards the eastern end of the roadway. Um, we can, uh, can really, um, there, there's some possibility for partnering with the local um, housing authority over there to get something installed. And so we're looking at that. And is there a community I mean, what's the, what's the community education effort there? I mean, what's the perception that people have about fences and turtle mortality? So luckily, um, you know, with this project um, and its history, there's been a lot of outreach and a lot of, um, you know, uh, effort to gain the public's support. Um, Roger Wood, who started this project, really kind of laid the groundwork for um, some long-term um, you know, public engagement. And uh, so there's actually a lot of people that live on this roadway that are very aware of the issue and put signs on their property. Um, we have a family that actually installed some nesting habitat on their property already, and we're working with others to do the same. So it's, um, I, I think there's some real potential for that in this area, especially um, because of the history of our research and conservation program here at the wetlands. Yeah, it's a hot spot for turtles. And I think it, that because of you guys, it's a hot spot for education too. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've done a lot of work with Phragmites in my life, and, and I, I, I know it's all along the edge on the causeway there. Do the turtles just plow through that stuff? I know they don't nest in it, but do they have any problems yeah. moving through it? They, they definitely plow through it. Um, it does look like it gives them some trouble. I, it would be really interesting to, to look at that in a more focused way um, because it does kind of run the length of the roadway, and uh, they do seem to, to plow through it. Um, but I've watched them go through it and it does take them some time. So <laughs> I'm sure that it's not, it's not an ideal, uh, ideal environment for them to pass through. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Hearing none. Thank you so much. No problem.
All right. You could unshare your screen. That'd be great. Gracias. All right. We're on to our next presentation. And it is by Brady Nichols and John Wenick. And uh, Brady's from Bowdoin College in Maine. The title of the talk is Investigating the Effect of High Road Temperatures on Terrapins via Mathematical Modeling. Brady, take it away. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So I am Brady Nichols, of course. I am a rising sophomore at Bowdoin College in Maine, and I'm studying the uh, investigating the effect of high road temperatures on Melanchthonus terrapin via mathematical modeling. So I am studying uh, bio and math at Bowdoin. So this is kind of a cool combination of what I'm interested in. And I've also been working with Dr. John Winnick for the past few years on Project Terrapin, uh, particularly the mark recapture efforts at Cedar on Dock Road. And so that's kind of what spawned the start of this project. I've been working on it since I was a senior at Mates. So I'll kind of be talking about the like initial stage of the project and the initial data and stuff. And then I'll be moving on to my future plans for the project. So just some background to make sure everyone's on the same page. Of course, female diamondback terrapins love nesting in sandy soils. A lot of the times to get to these soils, they have to navigate roads or other substrates. And this is dangerous for a lot of reasons, uh, including like road mortalities, as we've talked about a lot in the past. In general, with terrapins, temperature is very important to consider for their ecology. So their eggs exhibit temperature dependent uh, sex determination. So it's determined by the, uh, the sex is determined by the temperature of the nest. And also in general, they're cold blooded. So they kind of just need the environment temperature to be within an acceptable range or they can't really deal with that. With this in mind, roads within the range can reach up to 65 degrees Celsius. Now this number is sourced from a pavement engineering study, interestingly enough. So that's kind of a cool crossover between like pavement science and some ecology. So with all of this in mind, this project was developed out of a concern that the heat of the roads may affect terrapins that are crossing said roads. And so the goal of this project overall was to create some sort of baseline for modeling the heat transfer between the roads and the plastron of the terrapin that are crossing the roads. So the first stage of this project was the experimental data collection. So to do this, we acquired a medium-sized female terrapin shell and placed it directly on a hot plate with a thermal couple measuring the temperature of like the top of the plastron. The heat hot plate was then set to one of two temperatures, 45 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> These temperatures were picked to kind of give a good range of like where we could kind of expect the model to work as kind of like a lower bound and maybe an upper bound. They then gathered data at five second intervals as the terrapin shell heated up. And the end result of this part was a curve of the internal temperature over time as the shell heated up. Then to make the stuff more as accurate as possible, we wanted to kind of incorporate the walking style of a terrapin. So as you can see, and as you've probably seen in the past, when a terrapin walks, its entire body is not always dragging on the ground. So for example, in the top right, you can see that the front part of this terrapin is lifted off the ground. And when it's doing that, it's obviously not receiving conduction from the ground, but rather radiation. So we wanted to incorporate radiation into this project by also collecting data on, in the same way as the previous slide, except this time the shell was propped upon two cauldrons so that it was only receiving radiation from the hot plate. So then onto the modeling part. Sorry, this slide is kind of a mess, but bear with me. The top equation was sourced from a book called Biophysical Ecology. Essentially, it takes the top, the first three parameters, which are, uh, I could just easily measure of uh, from the terrapin shells that I had. And it outputs the heat transferred from the hot plate to the plastron in one second. And then two other parameters we needed was thermal conductivity and specific heat capacity of the terrapin shell, which were sourced from uh, various other studies on alpha keratin from textiles and bovitorns. So anyway, top equation outputs the heat transferred from the hot plate to the plastron after one second. And then the bottom equation converts that heat to a change in temperature. 
And then this change in temperature can be added to the temperature of the terrapin shell on the first equation. And then that's the temperature change after one second. And then that can just be run over and over again to get a very similar curve to the experimental data collection. Now, how similar was this? Well, it worked pretty well. So if I get my pointer out, the red line here is the theoretical data produced by the equations. And then the blue line is the raw experimental data, and the green is a best fit of the experimental data. So you see when compared, it worked pretty well. And there's a few reasons that are illustrated here as to why you need a model in the first place rather than just using the raw data. So as you can see, the line of best fit, the green line, it's a secondary polynomial. So it actually curves downwards, which is not how um, heat transfer works, obviously. So the model actually like, you know, takes into consideration like, oh, this is heat transfer, so it should level off. And you can see like the blue raw data follows the red line more than the green line. Another reason, and this is, uh, as I was talking about before, why we chose the two temperatures, is because now that we know it works at like the lower end maybe, and it also works at the higher end, we can kind of extrapolate this model to fit more temperatures in the middle of the two temperatures. And you'll see that in a bit later. So yeah, comparing the radiation uh, experimental versus theoretical, it also works pretty well. Again, it's not perfect, but thinking about this study as just like a baseline, it works well enough to continue. Radiation was simulated in a bit of a weird way, I think, instead of, uh, well, essentially we took the temperature of the surface and found what the air temperature should be right below the plastron and then um, and then did the conduction equation with that air temperature. So probably not the best way to do things, but it works again because this is more of a baseline study. So putting this all together, we can kind of make like a final simulation of sorts. So here, so for this diagram, you can imagine you're holding a terrapin and its plastron is facing you and the terrapin is like the head is facing upwards. So this bottom is the bottom of the plastron. And if you were thinking back to when we saw the terrapin walking, this part is going to be the part that's more heavily affected by conduction, whereas the front part is going to be more heavily affected by radiation throughout the entire cycle of the terrapin walking. So I treated this by making the bottom or the back always use conduction, the middle alternate between conduction and radiation, and the top doing all radiation. And this is kind of illustrated in this graph of the internal temperature like simulated over time. So the top line here is the back and it's faster because it's uh, only using conduction, which is of course more efficient at um, transferring heat and radiation. And then the middle is kind of wavy because it was alternating between conduction and radiation and the bottom, the bottom line, which is the top of the plastron. Sorry, that's a bit confusing, but yeah. And so thinking about this in the context of the eggs, which is what we're really worried about, Eggs are located in like the back two thirds of the body of the terrapin. And so for the like final results that I'll show in the next slide, I used the average of the back two numbers. Now this graph's a bit weird, but I did it this way for a reason. So we can kind of allow an estimate of how much terrapins can heat up based on site parameters and the weather at the time. So say you have a location where a terrapin has to cross the road for 100 seconds. So you can use the top right subplot, and then you can say, okay, say the weather that day allowed for 60 degrees of road temperatures. So then you can look here, and you can say, okay, so then any terrapins crossing on this given day will reach 40 degrees Celsius internal temperature. And the lines are at 35 and 50, just so you can get a better idea of, of you know, where they are. Now these numbers may seem pretty high, and this is kind of an overestimate, but there's also other things that I was considering. First of all, when working on Cedar Run Dock Road, a lot of the times when we go to pick up terrapins, they kind of stop on the roads. Maybe they're scared of the of the cars coming by. And so you know, that's a reason they might be on the road for longer than if they're just crossing the roads. Another thing to consider is that they are also crossing other substrates at certain sites. So they might have to cross a road and then cross sand, or they might have to cross uh, gravel or a, a driveway or something. And also when the female is laying the eggs, 
she still has to dig in the sand or dig in the substrate. And so that can affect her, you know, even more. So this is kind of the final, like, this is the graph, like, of the results of the first, like, part of the project. And so now I'm just going to talk about some ways that I plan to improve this in the future. So in general, I want to use the road temperature data set that I mentioned in the background slide as kind of a better estimate. So instead of just having like a range of road temperatures, I can kind of narrow it down to like, okay, what are the most likely road temperatures instead of just looking at a minimum and a maximum. Also, of course, cleaning up the model, instead of having it be a baseline, I talk to some people who are uh, like thermodynamics experts and kind of figure out the best way to simulate all of these things. I would also like to find some sort of mechanism by which the terrapins can actually be harmed by the temperatures. So, you know, are, are the females themselves more at risk? Is it like the incubating eggs? And this is something that hasn't really been studied that much in terrapins or in turtles in general. There's a lot of studies on like the, you know, lethal temperature of incubation for like 50% of the eggs, which is around 34 to 35 degrees Celsius. But obviously that temperature has a lot more of an effect on the eggs when it's you know sustained rather than what I'm looking at, which is a quick burst in temperature of maybe a few seconds to a few minutes. And lastly, I'd like to collaborate with other researchers with like hatchling and nesting data sets and try to create a correlation between maybe nesting success, nesting success and the temperature and find the direct effects of the road temperatures on terrapin hatchlings. So I would like to thank Dr. John Winnick, of course, for being my mentor over the past few years and getting me involved in Project Terrapin, the reason I'm here today, and for being my advisor throughout this project. I'd also like to thank Michelle Budd for providing the Terrapin shell that I used for this project and for being someone to bounce ideas off of throughout the length of the project. And I'd like to thank Mates for providing all of the lab and all of the equipment. So thanks, and I can take questions now. All right. Thank you very much, Brady. Uh, interesting to have the intersection of pavement science and terrapin eggs. That's, a, that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. I, that probably hasn't been done before. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, Scott Smith in the chat asked the question, uh, could you use eye button temperature sensors uh, during the nesting season to actually get the real temperatures that are out on the roads? Yes, that would be really, really awesome to get. Um, but yeah, that's a part of the, uh, another part of the thing, like the, you know, collaborating, collaborating with other researchers, because you also have to think about like every site is very, very different. So you know, there's some sites where they just have to cross the road, some sites where they have to cross the road and then go over like a whole beach, like the washover site and LBI. And yeah, so getting more accurate road temperatures like that is, you know, would be a really, really, really great way to, you know, make this project more true to the real world. Mm -hmm. That I was thinking of the previous talk that Brian gave about, you know, the times that turtles are crossing the road and the intersection of tide and time for, for when they're actually potentially could be exposed to some of the hottest temperatures on roads, depending on, you know, when they're, when they're out there and how much sun is out there in a particular time. But I would think, and then maybe Brian could answer this question, especially your last slide about, about hatchlings. Uh, I would think that they would be incredibly susceptible if they're out on the <laughs> out on a road and it'd be very quick to, to uh, be in trouble, be, to be stressed out. Brian, do you guys have any information on hatchlings on roads? Um, I, I don't think we have any uh, hard data on it, but I do know that when we find terrapin hatchlings on the property, uh, there have definitely been times where we found them in, you know, a stage of, of like desiccation, basically where they, they seem pretty dehydrated um, and, and very, warm, almost overheating. So um, usually we just put them in a little bit of water and we get them right back out. But uh, yeah, it's, um, I could definitely see it having impacts. Usually when I see terrapins crossing the roadway, the, the hatchlings anyway, they're really going as fast as they can. Um, unfortunately, I feel like most of them don't, don't make it across our roadway given how busy it is. Right. And then I guess something else that we can consider too is when the when the hatchlings come up out of the nest and like they're like in the cages and they they're on the sands, which is presumably pretty hot. I mean, I guess it's more towards like the fall that they're coming out, but you know, still I figure that's a good thing to look at. 
Yeah, it seems to me that um, the hatchlings that I see uh, walking across our trail as well, any open habitat that they pass through, they try to pass through it as quickly as possible um, and get to, you know, nearest vegetation to hide in. Um, but yeah, I could, I could definitely see in situations where they could be trapped, it could be detrimental. All right. Well, thanks very much, Brady. Appreciate Thank you. It. And I love the uh, red comment on pointer. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. All right. If you stop sharing. Okay. Screen, yeah. Okay. There, there we go. go. All I right. can do a turn. All right. Our next speaker is uh, um, another product from Mates, I believe. Um, this is looking at uh, the nest ecology of Diamondback Terrapin selection between developed and enhanced sites. And it's given by Courtney Parks and her co-authors are Scott McRobert and John Wenick. Courtney? Hi, yeah. I am not with Mates or came from Mates actually. I was with Dr. Wenick for Project Terrapin. So still uh, affiliated. <laughs> gotcha, but St. Joseph's University. Yes, I there am a go. grad student at St. Joe. There you go. <laughs> All right, go Hawks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, i am just set this up. So thank you for the introduction. Um, as we just said, my name is Courtney Parks and I am under Dr. Scott McRobert at St. Joseph University as a grad student. And I got the opportunity to work with Dr. Winnick with Project, Project Terrapin for my nest ecology of Diamondback Terrapins and selecting between the developed and enhanced site. So it's a little bit uh, new, uh, methodology that we tried, so I'm excited to talk about it today. So as most of you know, um, that Diamondback Terrapins, since we're in the mid, the mid-Atlantic region, we are more up in this region of the coastal mid-Atlantic, as you can see on this map, but my specific study site is going to be on Cedar Run Dock Road, which is just a road branch off of Route 9 in New Jersey. And we know that diamondback terrapins are considered special concern and a viable species in New Jersey. So I really liked the study site, or we use this site primarily because we, it's a well-known study site as well as it has high volume of residential development in the salt marsh area. So we are really focusing on developed versus enhanced, and we have the developed sites with residents, and we also have really good enhancement sites, we have three prime spots. So we were able to get good comparisons with this study. Our nesting season itself, we started recording numbers in late May and up until mid-July, but our last date that we collected data was the first of July because we exceeded our numbers. And at that point, they did start slowing down. So there are issues with nesting, as Brian and many others have mentioned during this conference already, a uh, high road mortality. Uh, while they're trying to cross the road, they are getting hit and they're not able to even make it to the nesting, sometimes with an injury. But those who do make it to the nesting areas, they are now having the difficulty of digging through the soil. Residents are now having more of a gravel barrier to prevent vegetation growth or other reasonings uh, such as decoration or preference for the, the lawn is now full of gravel. And this is more difficult for females to have to dig through the gravel because now the gravel, the nest is going to be more shallow. And as Brady was trying to show, as certain areas that can be overheating and that can cause problems as well. And in addition, the hatchlings are now having a difficult time trying to dig out of the gravel at these developed sites. Another issue with nesting is going to be the sea level rise and how some nests can be flooded. And with this flooding, it can lead to overwinter hatchlings. And we have noted or have seen just recently that overwinter hatchlings have a more difficult time with development as well. But that's not going to be on our topic today. We're going to just keep focusing on enhanced and developed sites. So an enhanced site, let me make sure I can see all this. At an enhanced site, um, it started a few years ago, at least in New Jersey, with the Long Beach Island Foundation. And as you can see on the left, it's where areas highly vegetative, 
and they assess it and they're able to remove that vegetation and add loads of sand, such as the one on the right, where that gives the female more opportunity to nest. And this was with Project Terrapin a few years ago. And since then, there has been more nesting sites, at least associated with Project Terrapin. So the importance of actual enhancement sites, it's going to reduce the mortality and injuries that many others have discussed today in the conference, such as looking at this, so you can see that it's easier to access. This is our, one of our, excuse me, one of our enhanced sites that we have. And it's at Cedar One Dark Road at the very end, and we called it the berm area. But at this area, you can see at the left of it, there's water connection right away. So it's going to be an easier access to the females. But on the right, there's a road. So ideally, this is going to allow the females to come up and surface and nest without having to interfere with that road, as well as provide females the opportunity to have deeper nests. We believe that when the females are nesting in a more developed area, it's too compacted and harder to dig down, and the nests are going to be shallower. So we believe that having a more enhanced or sand substrate, they are going to have a better opportunity to dig deeper. We also believe that because it's less compacted, it'll be easier for them to dig through. So there's going to be a shorter time frame rather than do, digging at developed sites. And as you can also see at our berm location, it is higher up at a certain point. And this is going to allow the nest to have to be drier so that whenever sea level rise or have massive flooding areas, those nests are going to be protected. And we can hopefully reduce the number of overwinter hatchlings to reduce the delay of development as well. Overall, all this I'm saying is that it's going to be more nesting opportunities for these females compared to the more developed areas now that there's a growth in human population. Just to re reinforce my image of developed versus enhanced, on the right is developed. As you can see, we would categorize this gravel as small and dark compared to our enhanced site, which is gonna be mostly sand substrate. And you can just see we were taking vegetation photo at this time and at the developed site, there is no vegetation, whereas enhanced there was some, but we were able to at least note both of them at the time too. So the main questions we're gonna be addressing on this is the, is the de depth difference between enhancement and developed sites? And with that question, we have to also look at difference between limb lengths. And is there a difference between sh shell sites and limb lengths? And since we are gonna be looking at the females themselves, we want to know if either site is drawing in more smaller or larger females that to nest, or is it strictly environmental factor? of how deep the nest can go. In addition, we would like to know, is there a difference between nest temperature and nest temperature at the different sites of developed or enhanced? So we did collect a lot of data this summer, but for the specific talk that we're talking about today, we mostly just did morphometrics of the nesting mothers, and that includes taking the straight carapace length, which starts at the nuchal on the carapace and goes all the way down her back, as well as the plastron with the same region of top to bottom, and then limb length. Limb length is a little different for us this year, so how we categorized it was the total limb length, and it was the entire leg of the nesting female that went all the way down to her highest like, point of the phalange. And then the next part that we tried to measure was the tibia to the phalange. So it's that region where you would think would be the knee of the terrapin. And I'm saying that very loosely, just to give you a general idea, but it's gonna be measured in that region down to the, the foot region. And that's gonna be categorized as half leg limb just for the rest of the presentation today. We also then measured along with the limb length and the female size, we also measured the nest depth. And we also noted the gravel size, whether it was small, medium, large, light, or dark. Since as Brady mentioned, there are temperature differences based on the substrate type and how long it took for her to nest. And then afterward, we would then work up the nest of environmental factors and then cover the nest with cage covers so that 
the hatchlings will be able to escape at the end of next hat emergent season, sorry. And we would have to then go back and assess to see who made it out and who didn't. So the first point of data that we just wanted to show you was the limb length versus the carapace length. So as you can see on the graph to the left, there is the limb length on the x-axis and the carapace length on the y-axis. And we were trying to show you that there is a weak positive correlation between the limb length and the carapace. And we can show that with our R and R squared values seen on the graph and on the table to the right of it. We were able to show that even though it's a weak correlation, there is some correlation to show that they are related to each other. And we're going to do talk about this again, but with the plastron, since we're trying to make sure we cover the majority size of the female size. size. And that's, once again, limb length on the x-axis and plastron length on the y-axis. But I do want to note that if you were able to note that the R square values are very weak on the carapace length, but compared to the plastron length, it is a little bit stronger in comparison. So there's a strong, like more moderate correlation between the limb length and the plastron length. The next thing we wanted to show you was the female size between enhanced and developed sites. So now that we know that the size of the limbs compared to the female cell size have at least a positive correlation, we wanted to prove that or show that if there was any difference of female size being large, medium, or small at either site. So on our bar graph here, we see in the light beige color is enhanced, whereas the dark gray is more developed. And on our y-axis is the shell length in millimeters. With that in mind, we were showing that with the p-value after our t-test of 0 0.6096, that there is no statistical difference between being at enhanced or developed site based on the female size. The next thing we wanted to show, since we just determined that the female size does not matter, is if there was an environmental factor of why the female or where the females could dig deeper at enhanced or developed. And we were able to show once again with enhanced being beige, developed being gray, at the nest depth on the y-axis, we were able to find a p-value of 0 0.0023. So it was significantly different that females could dig deeper at enhanced sites compared to developed sites. So just to conclude all those numbers and make sure we understand everything that happened, we did find out that limb length was possibly correlated with the carapace and plastron length, where plastron length was a little bit more strongly correlated compared to the carapace. We also want to make a note of this, that we do believe that the numbers of the R values are variable because we did not have just one person measuring leg length. We actually had multiple workers trying to help with measurements since we did collect a lot of data this summer, and we believe that there could be some variation because of that. And we're going to try to come up with a more stricter method for next field season. Another thing that we found was there was no difference for the females at the nesting or enhanced site for the size. So a smaller female was not selecting a developed or enhanced site more often in same or vice versa for the larger female looking for a more enhanced or developed site as well. And we also saw that at nest steps, we were having a deeper nest step at enhanced compared to the developed sites. So those who were able to go to enhanced site, they were able to dig deeper compared to those who were at developed was more compacted soil with a gravel barrier, they had a very shallow um, nest as well. And although the, our goal was to hopefully have the temp nest temperatures of the two to compare enhanced versus developed, we are still collecting that data right now as the hatchlings are now starting to emerge within the next week or so. For the, and once we have that, we'll be able to retrieve those I buttons that we installed in nest at the bottom, mid, and top at each location. 
and we'll be able to have a general idea of how hot enhanced nests could be or how uh, and same what the developed as well to see if there's any types of difference between the two. And we'll be able to then assess if the nest was successful by hatching emergence and see who's actually able to get out of the nest at either site. So long term, this is not something that's going to be just a few years study. We need to think of this in a climatological time period and we're looking ahead for like 30 years from now. We need to take action before it's too late. And I know Dr. Wenick has mentioned this to me a few times during the season, and I'm sure he has more um, knowledge or has the numbers to to back it up and everything, but he did mention that 20 years ago, diamondback terrapins were very highly populated or using Sedge Island. And recently he's having a hard time with the nesting population this past year. So is, was, was there a need for enhancement sites back at Sedge Island 20 years ago to prevent the default of nesting population now? So in order to prevent that from other locations, we are hoping to do future research of the nest temperatures, are there other environmental factors such as vegetation, external composition, and is it faster or easier for females to dig out enhanced versus develop sites to prevent overheating and let they allow them to get back to the water and away from the other elements faster? And to once again, to assess all this as success, we need to just measure it by the amount of hatchlings that we believe were able to emerge and successfully leave the nest. So all this information, it's all going to be continued at Athens, Georgia. So once again, it is just a beginning stage of a big study, and we would like to then present more information next year, because then at that point, we will have our nest temperatures at both sites, and we will have that statistics ready for you, as well as vegetation. So we did take a before and after photo of the vegetation of each nest, but some obviously some nests, most of them have not emerged yet, so we don't have the before and after percentage to present to you today. And we would like to as well document those who were able to emerge at the developed or enhanced site as success, which site is more likely to help the Diamondback Terrapin population. And it's not a matter of when to add the sites rather than where and what other sites can we start adding enhancement sites to before it's too late. And Cedar Run Dock Road currently has three of them, but I know Ben Worst from Great Bay Boulevard about two years ago has introduced an, his own enhancement site down there. And it's been very busy this past summer. And that's just one other site. And I believe that we should start trying to think of ways and look at start the data to understand what we should do and perfect it for the rest of the nesting population. Just to wrap up, I want to thank all my assistants and those who have mentored me and helped me get through this summer project. It was a very busy summer and then was very hot on some days, but I, everyone stuck it out and we got a lot of good numbers this year. So thank you everyone. <laughs> And that's it. I'll take any questions if anyone has any. All right. Thank you, Courtney. Right. Any questions that anyone has? I'm wondering if those enhanced sites end up getting uh, more nest predators. Are they attracted to them? Yeah, well, that's what I thought as well. Um, well Dr. Winnick and I talked about it. It's, but I think at Cedar Run Dock Road, where we are at, the predators don't go down that far, if that makes sense. But yeah, we have the nest cover. So we have a pretty good spot to protect the nest. But I think at other locations, there might be more difficulty. It won't be as easy based on, I guess, the predator population as well. Right. All righty. Well, to keep a little bit on schedule, we'll uh, 
thank you, Courtney. And we can uh, continue to discuss uh, that after the break. We have our final speaker. Uh, it's John Wenick. And John's going to talk about Terrapin Town, a community effort in Diamondback Terrapin Conservation in Stafford Township, New Jersey. Thank you, Randy. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, you heard about some of the, the research going on in more specifically Courtney's work and where Brady worked at. We're in a place called Stafford Township, uh, sometimes called Manahawkin, and they have different regions within it. Um, but I want to change gears a little bit. So this is more in the educational vein, something that's a little bit more community minded. And I know a lot of you out there are conducting um, community projects overall. So I, I know there's a lot of information here that might be redundant, but we wanted to look at this more from a township level. So uh, we're going to just share some of the um, some of the initiatives that we're working on in Stafford. But I'm going to start off with acknowledgments. Usually we save them for the end. And I really want to acknowledge um, a lot of the community here, um, including Mayor Meyer in the council um, and um, some others that are listed here, including the wonderful citizens um, over here in Stafford Township that have really started to embrace uh, some of these initiatives. And I'm also going to put a disclaimer in here, too, that Stafford also has numerous other turtles. I know we're here focused on the Diamondback Terrapins, but this is kind of far reaching and we're trying to reach out to the community to educate them about the other turtle species that uh, inhabit the area as well. Um, so these are some of our acknowledgements and some of our families that were involved. And as a little bit of a background, um, Barnegat Bay um, in New Jersey has some initiatives that are going on now. Uh, some are on this meeting right now um, in Long Beach Island that do some great work down there. Um, also, Conserve Wildlife and Ben Wurst, uh, Courtney alluded to him in the uh, turtle garden that they established there uh, on, on one of the locations. So there's been a lot of research and population work throughout Barnicket Bay over the years uh, with many different entities, whether it be academic, whether it be, you know, through, through some of the uh, nonprofits, you know, so be it. But one of the things that we wanted to look at is how do we get this information out and how do we make get people more involved. And one of the things we wanted to do is look at some of these key areas where we're working and seeing if we can look at this more from a, a larger scale, possibly get full communities involved. You know, it's really tough with research because you have to be permitted to do this work and have experience, of course, but there's other ways to get uh, people involved and help with some conservation methods as that's, you know, some of the goals overall. So I'm going to focus on where we work out of, uh, Stafford Township. Um, Stafford Township is unique um, in that it, I call it the gateway to Long Beach Island. Um, you have to drive through Stafford Township to get to Long Beach Island. Long Beach Island is one of the more popular um, tourist or visited areas um, throughout not only New Jersey, but on the East Coast of the United States. Stafford is also very interesting as well because the Western boundary is in the midst of the Pine Barrens, um, unique community. And if you go out to the eastern boundary towards where we head towards Barnicket Bay, um, there's an expansive marsh system. And management of that is not only statewide, but it's also federal through US Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's entities that overlap. Many, many communities have that across the East Coast. I know some of you may work in some of those that have many jurisdictions. So uh, when we're working, you know, especially with terrapins, there's many entities that we have to work with at different levels, but we also you know, are working in Stafford Township itself, and we really want to get that information out to the community. You know, research is, is, is very important. We can learn about populations, but we also want to get that information and make it digestible and also get people involved, and that's how they're going to, to process and, and really take more ownership and stewardship overall. So I'm focusing on this area here. So you can see this this uh, map we have on the right-hand side, you can see uh, quite a bit of marsh and that arrow that I have is actually pointing to a community called Beach Haven West, which I'm gonna focus on as well. Um, so back to reference with Courtney, um, looking at that, here's Beach Haven West. I circle it because it's one of the most densely populated areas. In the 1950s and 60s, they started filling in salt marsh for building purposes, development purposes. So throughout the 1970s um, into the 80s, homes were being built. Uh, what makes it unique is that it's 
24 miles when they kind of added it up of, of lagoonal or waterway and over a hundred different lagoon systems. So it's impacted or sometimes not as impacted through tidal flushing. Um, it's concentrated with homes. I'll show you some pictures over there, but it's also surrounded by salt marsh. And much of that marsh is managed, you know, at the federal level through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And right to the south is the Cedar Run Dock Road area that Courtney is talking about. And then we've also done work on U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Cedar Bonnet Island area as well. So one of the challenges is, you know, what, what do you do when you have such a, you know, expansive community like that, or this development that's in the middle, you know, of this area. So what happened, Stafford Township, because of the um, development and over the years, we're worried about lagoonal depths. Uh, you get shallow lagoons, maybe they don't flush out as well. So they had a whole bathymetric survey conducted recently through ACT Environmental that went through and looked at uh, lagoonal depth throughout the whole entire township. So those areas that I circled, including Cedar Run, were included in that as well. And this was very important to us because this is Cedar Run Dock Road. You can see some development immediately to the, to the north of that, of that bathymetric uh, profile. Um, and that's important because this is an area where terrapins access to go and nest along that roadway. So um, we'll come back to this. Uh, this was just some recent work. So when we're dealing with conservation, we got to put all of these things together, um, like research, uh, looking at actions you know, based upon that research, how that's allowable or are viewed by management and what their recommendations are. But then the overall you know, part of this is involvement. You know, how, do, how, do we, how do we get people involved? How do we get communities involved? You know, how do we network the researchers with the managers and then you know, have that action take place? So that's what I'm going to kind of focus on. So with this project, what we wanted to do is focus on volunteer opportunities. Um, project Terrapin um, is an initiative that we work on where I work at, um, and that involves students, much like Brady, you know, what was part and still is part of that. But then it also focuses on the community. And then we wanted to also bring in a citizen science monitoring component. And then finally, we want to, you know, really kind of weave that together through community education projects to see if we can get this, this word out and do this on a, on a township level, you know, through Stafford Township. Okay. There you go. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to um, work on what we call a nest cover. So for Courtney's project, she worked uh, with nest covers to protect nests so that she could gather information on hatchlings and identify the nest. And the main predator in some of the areas, especially on Cedar Run, are crows. Uh, we're very fortunate, knock on whatever, because it's about three miles out through a marsh system that we haven't seen a high density of mammalian predators. I mean, maybe that's yet to come. That could always happen. But we're we're just dealing with crows now. So some of these cages that allow the hatchlings to emerge and protect them from immediate threats work out really well. Um, there's also some community members that reached out to Stafford Township itself and were concerned because they have terrapins that nest in their area and they, they have the crows that are digging them up. And the town and I met and we wanted to come up with some of these actions. What also helped was the fact that the mayor one day came out while we were conducting some population research on Cedar Run Dock Road. I didn't know it was the mayor at the time. Pulls up, um, he starts helping us measure turtles, and then he takes out his card and introduces himself as the mayor. And he had some experience with this back in the past when he was an undergraduate um, as, as far as some terrapin work. So that's kind of opened the door. His, his exposure to terrapins initiated this conversation, and we kind of moved forward. You know, if we, we went a few years ago, we, this actually happened. But overall, what we're, what we're doing is um, we're putting together what we call like nest covers so that we can make that. So we have some students kind of making them over there on the left-hand side. And then here's the uh, tower of nest covers that we have in the school. And that was a volunteer effort. And one of the things that I kind of wrote and I put over here to the side is that we're kicking off this initiative with COVID restrictions. So a lot of things we have to do have to be due not only with spacing, 
but involvement is very difficult, especially when we have COVID protocol, uh, protocols in place and we um, are trying to do this as safely as possible. So things should even move ahead more. Um, one of the things we're able to do is um, what Courtney is studying on nest site enhancement. One of our areas, we're able to get um, one of the local uh, scout groups, that's Girl Scout uh, Troop 1, actually out of this area in the Manahawkin area. And they came out and helped us get the turtle garden um, ready for use um, this, this past year. So we're gonna have that as an ongoing initiative in some of our areas to get those groups involved as well because they heard about what we're doing. But back to Beach Haven West, uh, we're working on Cedar Run Dock Road and there's a vast marsh system there. And I have these arrows kind of moving towards that area that I'm talking about in Beach Haven. Um, one of the roads I have outlined in red is Mill Creek Road. Um, I also have this other line, you can see these lines going out to um, this area over that circled in blue, that's the uh, Cedar Bonnet area that we've been doing some work on ourselves. It's uh, once again, US Fish and Wildlife Service managed. So we go over there with research assistants and permitted personnel to go over and do some assessments there. But we also noticed that there's, um, you know, some nesting that is taking place even on that Mill Creek area. And that's where, you know, our project kind of comes into play to get the citizens a little bit more involved in that. And we're wondering, are some of our turtles that we have marked on Cedar Run Dock Road, and we have um, a marked population there, are any of them going to be found in that Mill Creek area? And we really are curious about that, but we just, you know, like other projects, we just don't have an expansive research staff. We depend on, you know, some research assistants in the summer, um, you know, some students doing work. You know, thankfully, Courtney's here to help us, and we had, you know, Brady and such, but we want to get some of the citizen involved to create stewardship and then find ways um, to do that. And the, and the town is um, also looking for that as well. So we work with um, some of the residents to monitor terrapin nesting and verification. Um, I'm showing you this picture on the bottom left. That's what Beach Haven West looks like if you drive down any of the main roadways. Um, if you're a terrapin and you liked housing, this would be ideal. Um, however, there's very few places for the terrapins to access, but as you travel down Mill Creek a little bit more, there's some areas, and one is a park that I have circled in red, and conveniently for us, right across the street from that park are the Koza family, Joseph and Fran, who stepped up to become what they call Mill Creek Road Coordinators. Um, so they served in the capacity of maintaining terrapin nest covers, um, they also maintain some signage, which I'll get into in just a couple minutes. And then they dispersed these out to wherever they saw people or property or neighbors that had nesting terrapins. And then we would go out periodically and truth what they had covered to say, yes, that is an active nest or no, maybe that was a, a false dig or maybe the terrapin, you know, um, just left and went to another area. So we had to kind of educate it on that. But Joe, and his wife, Fran, became very proficient at determining nests or not. And then we would go, we would GPS those. We're going to you know, put those into a layered map and then present that to the town. And also, we worked with the town on managing mowing of this area because they would come out periodically and cut the vegetation there. But we worked with them in terms of where the terrapin nests were and on a mowing schedule. And they were very um, connected to that. And that's something that you know, we worked with as well. One of the things that we were most excited about was how do we get the schools involved and community involved? So we worked with Stafford Township's Green Committee and started this initiative of lawn sign. So one of the things that we found is that if you put a sign up and it's a static sign that's there all the time, I have one in front of my house and I couldn't even tell you what it, what it is, but I know it's there. However, when we go down Cedar Run Dock Road, we find a series of signs that were handmade or seasonally put up and they become, they stand out a little bit more. So what we came up with was a concept where we would have a design contest, have lawn signs made up and then have residents agree to put the signs up, take them down, you know, after emergence or, you know, at the end of the summer, and then 
put them back up again next year. I mean, that's based on if they're going to still, you know, be at that residence or not. But we ended up putting it out through a community contest. So we put it out through Stafford schools. We put it out through the uh, Stafford Township has multiple social media sites that they get information out on. Um, and these were just some of the finalists when they submitted their, their renderings. And uh, the one we went with was the one on the top left. And we had those signs produced and they were distributed through the town. So you can contact the town and you could pick one up from town hall or you could pick them up, you know, at those what we call regional coordinators uh, places like Joe and Katie. And then I also wanted to um, point out the, the one on the top right, the turtle crossing sign It's actually behind me as well in the room here. Um, that one, you know, didn't take first place based on this committee, but it was just too, too neat to not have produced. So we produced some of those anyway, and they became really uh, popular. So we had those individuals that designed those signs. It became a, it became something that was well received in the community. And, uh, you know, we look forward to that. The other thing we did was a series of information pieces. The mayor was nice enough um, to include us in a podcast. He did that prior to the start of nesting season. And then they periodically put out announcements about terrapins um, or other turtles too. We, we alluded to that in, in the community. And you could see some of the posts that were out there as well. So that, that's an important initiative. And in town hall, they put up a display so that when you come in, you can, um, you know, see the um, display about the signs. And we're going to continue with those social media kind of blasts that they use for conservation purposes. So future collaborations, what are we going to do to kind of continue this? Um, we're going to do the lawn sign contest again. It was very popular. And, uh, you know, it was something that we felt the community got more involved with. Um, we're we're talking with Stafford right now and they're putting together a firm date on some type of festival, hopefully, you know, in person in the spring, we wanted to do this in person. Um, I didn't even talk about bycatch reduction devices. That's something we do at Project Terrapin. We just distribute those. We're going to get into that in the next phase about making people, you know, more BRD wise um, and, and trying to get that initiative going. Um, increasing more surveys. We want to see what the effectiveness is, you know, in terms of what we do, but we also want to get uh, more people involved in surveying and, and take that up another level um, so we can get some data on, on habitat use and so forth and possibly look at enhancing one of those park areas as well. And then once again, those community posts and social media um, phases are going to be important. So the one thing I wanted to say is, um, you, know, um, you know, contact me if you have any comments or questions. I know this is just a basic overview of some of the initiatives that we're starting to do with the towns, but taking this kind of approach, I really feel we have a greater community effort. I really feel Courtney's work and, and what she has done on Cedar Run Dock Road as well with those residents, they were for the most part, extremely receptive to her working on those developed sites where she had to be on private property and they knew more about this project and they were more, you know, welcome to this, and it's more of a community event. So I'm, pre I'm, I'm really presenting on behalf of the community who has started to embrace the terrapins and other turtles too. Um, but and we and we really look forward to working with them um, in the future. So thanks. All right, thanks, John. We have time for questions. If anyone has any questions about that, I mean, that was really at the Granular, granular level to uh, have to get that level of engagement with so many different groups to uh, to make this to make this really work. Yeah, it, 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 it's 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 really um, it's really rewarding because you get to share not only your research but you also um, see that the people start to make the connection to where they live and into the the habitat and the ecosystem around them mm -hmm. and. There are some some people that are good stories. The only thing I, I didn't mention here is we're trying to increase turtle knowledge, uh, you know, overall Broadly, and terrapin yeah. knowledge. So we're going to try to come up with a metric to to measure that in the community. Uh, the township is very uh, interested in that as well. And like I said, we're very fortunate to be working with a community that really wants to embrace this and and involve their their residents overall. So that's why we want to, you know engage as many, you know, not just terrapins, but the other turtles too, and some of the other areas uh, throughout Stafford. Yeah, I think everybody, 
has an appreciation for turtles in, in a broad sense, but that we all know that the, you know, the charismatic nature of terrapins are just, they're, oh. they're, they're beautiful. Absolutely. Skin colorations and shells and everything else just makes them a, a, a prime candidate for, for these sorts of environmental education and, and outreach opportunities. Right. And then the other, the other side of it too, makes them attractive in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, another way too, which is not, you know, unfortunate in some ways through poaching and everything else. That's right. And that's, that's what this project is about too, is if we make more people aware and kind of watch over those areas, um, and know that they have turtles there. They know they have terrapins there. But now if they know they're connected, they can actually embrace protecting them more and maybe, you know, observe some things that they don't see that are normal in that environment. Like, why is that car here? Or what, what, why is that person going up and down, you know? And, mm -hmm. and we, can, we can possibly have better, um, you know, what do you want to call it? Observations or supervisions, you know, over, over the terrapins. Right. So who permitted the uh, Beach Island West? Who, who, who allowed that to be developed like that? <laughs> that was um, New Jersey State. It, uh, it, in fairness, it was before the DEP was established. Ah. It was just that marshes were considered mosquito laden areas that you yep. can get very, you know, very inexpensive properties. Sometimes you were able to, to secure a marsh through a newspaper subscription. They'd give, you a, <laughs> they'd give you a piece of a marsh and no one really wanted to take hold of it because you would get bit by greenheads or mosquitoes and it yeah. wasn't, you know, it wasn't a place that you would enjoy. But some people figured out that if you filled it with, with some film material, that it could actually support development. And, um, and we know across our range here with terrapins, you know, those coastal areas are so prized in terms of development, you know, not only are their prizes to us in terms of like what their habitat supports ecologically, but you know, on the other side of it, they're where people want to move to, you know. Yep. Do those canals have uh docks and are people crabbing off of those docks or there there's so many resident like it's it's very difficult to find areas that are open in between those areas. You you the density of homes um it is just so great i didn't point out i also have to point this out too that joe and fran coza are also president of the beach haven homeowners association mm -hmm. so we're able to mobilize you know as many people as we can on this project uh just getting and we didn't know that going into it but but joe is very excited and he's he, you know he's doing that but they're also i brought those bathymetric maps in because there's talk you know it's just talk now because they have to get permitting that eventually, if they get permitting to do dredge work, um, there's some beneficial use aspects of what they do with the material that we're, you know, we're looking into to create, you know, additional nesting habitat for terrapins. Mm -hmm. So that that's on the, the radar for way down the line, but that's another layer of this project that we're looking into. So right. great. Any other questions for John? Yeah, I heard about crows digging up nests somehow. Um, the crows are definitely going after the eggs in the nest. So that's those, the cages kind of work well to prevent that, you know, from happening. All right. Get into, let's see. Well, super. So I was thinking that we would take like a five minute break and then maybe we would come back and, uh, maybe we could get a, a representative from each of our mid Atlantic States to talk about, uh, some of the, uh, ongoing concerns regarding terrapin populations or some of the other efforts with respect to conservation research, management, education that are going on in their states. So let's take a five minute break and we'll reconvene at uh, 11.08. All right. We're done our little five minute break and uh, we can get back to a, a little discussion uh, about diamondback terrapins from a number of different frameworks. Some could be responding to talks. Uh, some could be a, a general discussion. One thing I was interested in uh, is finding out uh, what's the latest and greatest from each of the different states uh, that are in the mid-Atlantic region. We've had a lot of presentations today about turtle nesting and uh, detection uh, in New Jersey area. Um, what else is happening in New Jersey uh, from the management side? Uh, I see Brian's on here. Um, 
What's ha what's happening with respect to turtles? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, yeah, thanks for this chance to give you know a quick update. I'm going to run through. You know, I just kind of jotted down a handful of different um, topics that uh, Jeanette Bowers Altman, who's also going to um, fill in for me. Uh, uh, you know, after I uh, try to go through some things and, you know, this is all kind of collective information that's been really kind of gathered from a lot of our, you know, Terrapin partners in New Jersey who you've heard from today. So, uh, you know, we're, we're always kind of considering, you know, ways to uh, do better, you know, with, with our roads and our causeways and reducing um, vehicular threat there. Uh, I think there's a lot of folks interested in seeing what's going on in the, um, the infrastructure bill at the federal level right now. Uh, you know, it's a very big bill, but uh, I just saw something the other day that there might be something like $350 million in there that might be earmarked, earmarked towards wildlife passage. So I think a lot of states are closely keeping an eye on that. Um, you know, again, going back to one of the presentations, you know, New Jersey thinks a lot about, um, you know, uh, crab pots, commercial and recreational, stoke times, uh, BRD compliance, uh, you know, derelict and ghost crab pot traps. Uh, we think a lot about, uh, you know, sea level rise um, and, and, you know, just trying to figure out, you know, where we might be able to maintain or, or create more resilient nesting areas. Um, you know, Jeanette and I get, get stuck with uh, doing a lot of environmental review. And so, you know, some of the projects that come up a lot with that are, uh, you know, dredging, uh, you know, beneficial reuse of, of dredge materials, uh, you know, beach replenishments, things like that. And, and so, you know, learning more about some of those kind of critical habitat areas for New Jersey terrapins, overwintering areas in particular, nesting areas in particular, um, and general habitat usage is increasingly becoming more important for us to understand better. Um, and, and maybe just to back up a step, uh, terrapins in New Jersey are what we call um, a, a candidate species for special concern. They're not truly a special concern species yet that has to go through uh, rulemaking um, and, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of see if, if that process starts this year or perhaps sometime, you know, first quarter next year. Uh, so, you know, so right now they're a candidate and, and you know, we're kind of given this opportunity to provide comment on Terrapin in a lot of projects, even though they're not, you know, kind of in that category that would usually trigger environmental review. So we're, you know, we're always, there's always kind of a balancing act there. Um, so those were, uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention um, uh, and, you know, maybe one of the highest level threats that we're concerned about um, is illegal collection. Uh, you know, we've, we've, you know, there, there was the, uh, the, the slide earlier, uh, just kind of showcasing, you know, the, the level of collection that was happening at one of our sites a couple of years ago. Um, we've got one of our uh, state conservation police officers um, on the call right now. Uh, and, you know, we went out to visit a couple of our project sites um, uh, yesterday and, you know, illegal collection, uh, you know, folks in that community of illegal collection, uh, you know, conservation and trying to mitigate that, you know, I've, I've identified, you know, eastern box turtles and terrapins as two currently very high target, you know, valued turtles, um, you know, nationally, uh, with, with maybe some emphasis even in, in New Jersey. So um, we're just always looking to mitigate that and, and you know, want to make sure that when people are seeing things, um, they're, they're kind of contacting the, the 18771 DEP number right away. Uh, or, or you know, your your local law enforcement connection to get a hold of someone as soon as you see something you know shady or sketchy going on. Uh, so that's just a quick little drop. Let me um, have Jeanette uh, fill in the blanks for me. Um, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think you covered everything. Uh, one of the things I I just wanted to mention too is that there does seem to be a little bit of movement in terms of. Um, doing some additional rulemaking that will um, adjust the existing uh, crab pot regulations. So uh, look for more to happen in New Jersey. Uh, I was finally um, got to go ahead to give a presentation to our Endangered and Non-Game Species Advisory Committee on what's been happening in terms of uh, terrapin drowning in Delaware Bay. Um, currently, the regulations are that um, commercial and recreational, you need to have an excluder on um, in, in creeks that are 150 feet 
wide or less and all man-made lagoons. And there, there does seem to be some movement in terms of looking at to extend that area um, and looking at possibly a distance from shore. So that's something um, that uh, eventually will be uh, uh, presenting to the Marine Fisheries Council. So um, uh, also just wanted to say that the, um, the excluder presentation was really helpful and not great information for New Jersey because we do have that two inch <laughs> um, by six inch excluder. So um, we're looking at different sizes. I like the oval design, um, but looking, maybe we'll, you know, consider making that a little bit smaller based on some of this information. So that was really timely. So thank you. So yeah, um, Brian and I, we do um, an awful lot of uh, scientific collecting permit reviews, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, environmental reviews, uh, especially with like um, dredging, using dredge material um, for possibly beneficial use. Um, so yeah, lot, lots going on. Um, and Brian's definitely gonna be taking the lead completely um, after next week because that's when I'm retiring, so. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, coming back to volunteer though, so I'm sure I'm gonna be out there, uh, you know, working with some Terrapin, you know, groups on some level. Yeah, so. you can't retire from that. You gotta keep going on that. No, definitely <laughs> not, so. All right. John, you might be seeing me. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Nate from Delaware Fish and Wildlife. Uh, care to provide any updates on what's happening in Delaware? Uh, sure, I can um, uh, talk about some of the projects that we're doing in Delaware. Thanks. Um, you know, terrapin in Delaware is listed as an S4 species. So uh, that means apparently secure, but we do do a lot of work with them. Uh, they're tier one priority in the uh, Delaware Wildlife Action Plan. So um, whenever there's any projects that come up uh, in environmental review, uh, we try to provide guidance um, to avoid any potential impacts uh, if we think there will be some uh, for those projects. Uh, we have uh, a volunteer program run through Delaware Fish and Wildlife. Um, to help turtles cross uh, a section of road uh, that lines uh, the Delaware Bay, uh, runs for about a mile. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have volunteers go there and move turtles off the road uh, during nesting season. Um, we also have a, a, a long section along a major highway um, where we have it fenced uh, that stretches about five miles uh, in total. Um, Delaware State Parks is in charge of that fencing and they just recently replaced it um, this past winter. Uh, we also had our uh, work with uh, Delaware Center for the Inland Bays. They do a lot of uh, volunteer and community um, interactions with terrapins. I do know that there are do uh, head count surveys uh, uh, throughout the inland bays um, and, and try to get uh, community basically involved in terrapin conservation. Um, and finally, uh, Delaware Sea Grant, uh, which is through the University of Delaware has initiated a project with uh, derelict crab pots. And they're working on determining how many uh, abandoned pots there are uh, in the inland bays in Delaware. Uh, they have been going through and removing some as well. Um, and that's a project that just got started uh, within the last uh, year or two. Um, so we've been, ass when it, been assisting them uh, with that research. Um, that's all that comes to mind right now. Nice. No, that's good. And I'm glad to hear that Sea Grant and University of Delaware are, are getting involved in some of this terrapin stuff, because I didn't know if there was much terrapin research from any universities or colleges in Delaware that, that are currently ongoing. So 
I'm glad to hear about the pot removal program. All right, how about uh, Scott Smith from Maryland? Would you, uh, I mean, you're, you're pretty much in tune with this stuff. What's happening? Sure. How you doing? Um, so, so just like a uh, Delaware, Maryland, uh, uh, terrapins in Maryland are an S4 species, so they're apparently secure, but they are in our state wildlife action plan as a, a species of greatest conservation need. So we, we have um, over the years, we um, um, at least since the last uh, swap in 2015, we have put a significant amount of uh, money towards doing monitoring and, and other things like that. Um, currently, there's a, as always, there's a lot of things going on with Maryland with terrapins, and there's a lot of different players. Um, the Maryland Coastal Bays program um, continues to do, do um, uh, headcount surveys that, that we began back in 2011, and they've they're they're still doing them with using citizen scientists. Uh, they also um, have been doing some ghost pot removal. They recently did a um, or attempted to do a citizen scientist ghost pot removal effort in in the uh, in the coastal bays there behind uh, Assateague Island, um, and it had had mixed mixed uh, success. But uh, it, it's uh, interesting to use uh, citizen scientists to do that. Um, we are um, um, well, of course. There's the uh, all the the research that uh, Wilm Rosenberg does out of Poplar Island, um, uh, particularly continued nest monitoring and 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 the huge head starting program that not only a uh, high university is involved with, but Maryland Environmental Services, um, the uh, um, Arlington Echo, uh, the National Aquarium, um, and uh, and other folks uh, with uh, terrapins in the classroom. The pandemic has really kind of impacted um, a lot of both field efforts and other efforts, as I'm sure it has in, in, in all states. Um, the Department of Defense at, at Pax Naval Air Station on the Western Shore has been monitoring and, and doing uh, nesting studies with their um, terrapin population for quite a few years now. Um, one, of the, one of the more recent projects we DNR have got involved with was um, one of our uh, long uh, rural roads that goes through a lot of marsh habitat um, in Somerset County. A few years ago, we had a huge, uh, massive uh, turtle roadkill uh, uh, issue. Um, over a seven mile stretch, there was, uh, I don't, I can't remember the number of turtles, but of seven different species were, were road killed with terrapins being the highest. So working with SHA, um, they are going to be, we're going to do an experiment. It, it was supposed to start this year, but they've been having problems getting um, the fencing. Uh, we're going to, uh, talking with um, the folks at the Wetland Institute, we're going to model some of it after what they're doing using that six inch corrugated um uh, tubing, and we're going to be placing it on a mile section of uh, uh, going through the marsh. It's a causeway um, on both sides of the roads. So it's it's basically uh, we're buying two miles of uh, fencing um, and uh, monitor uh, that area um, for um, for turtle uh, turtle roadkill, and and uh, it's going to redirect them. Um, and state highways is paying for all this. Um, I, I hope it leads to an evolution where they realize they need to put in some turtle crossing, some actual, uh, similar to some of the work that's been done in New Jersey for bog turtles and in Florida for turtles with um, some of the uh, turtle crossings through the roads. Um, a few years ago at the replacement of a bridge in my county, in Caroline County on the shore, which was also a hot spot for, for turtle roadkill, uh, they did put in uh, turtle fencing to when they built a new bridge to completely exclude turtles from the, uh, from the roadway. And they did put in a, a, a turtle tunnel. Um, um, there is some terrapin use there. That's more non, non terrapin species. Recently, I've been working with a grad student, John um, Garrison at Antioch, New England, who uh, is from Maryland and is taking all of our uh, terrapin uh, headcount data, uh, which is, we have about a decade's worth as well as as much other, uh, terrapin location uh, data we have and is doing a bunch of habitat suitability modeling and hotspot modeling uh, as far as uh, areas that are uh, the most important for terrapin conservation. So that's going to be uh, pretty interesting uh, to do uh, to see the results of what he has going on. What region is he doing that in? Well, he's doing it in, in, uh, statewide in the whole Chesapeake and coastal bays. He's, he's look, uh, basically uh, assembling as much location data 
that is out there. And there's a lot for Maryland um, of, of varying qualities, um, not just Head Start data, but the USGS nesting study. Um, I, I don't mean Head Start, I mean Head Count data um, and, and a few other studies that have been done um, here. And he's, he's doing some GIS modeling with that data. Uh, so that's going to be really interesting to see um, what what comes of that effort. Yeah, um, Robert Isdell, who's down here in Virginia, has done a little bit of that work in, in a portion of the southwestern portion of the bay. And we're considering expanding that uh, in Virginia, too. That's really cool. Um, and and um, maybe I, I don't want to talk about this now, but I will before we're done today is I do want to talk about um, our, our, our RCN, our Regional Conservation Needs Grant that's uh, for Diamondback Terrapins that is being done throughout the region. Uh, from Virginia up to Maine. I mean, the, the eight states in the region uh, that um, have Terrapin, seven of them are participating, and, and we're hoping New York decides to participate in it. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit, but I think I'll give other states a, a chance to chime in on what they're doing, and then maybe we can circle back to it. Great. Thank you, Scott. Well, we've only got Virginia to go here, so uh, either, I guess, I guess, Pam Denman maybe first, and then maybe Megan after that. Yeah, I can't really speak to Virginia. I can only speak to um, our site, uh, the Eastern Shore of Virginia National sure. Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. Uh, we do have, um, we have installed uh, new fencing along Fisherman Island. It's actually on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel property. Um, it's uh, made out of concrete. We, we were using the Wetlands Institute, um, con I mean, the uh, corrugated tubing before that but we were having a lot of issues with um, it becoming degraded um, and vegetation maintenance around it. Um, we're still doing a lot of maintenance with the concrete, however, with uh, vegetation maintenance and we get some wash under uh, right. forms. And so we have to put gravel back down. But uh, the other issue we have is it's not totally um, extended along the entire area. So we are getting some escapes. Um, but in all, I think it is working better than the concrete barrier. Um, last year, we had four escapes that got hit. And this year, we had four again. Um, so I think, it, and, and they were all seem to be in the area of the end on the one side. Um, that's not totally encapsulated by the barrier. Um, we got the funding through federal highways and the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel was the person that put the application in. We couldn't put the application in, but they could. So um, all in all, I think it's, I think it is a little less maintenance than the, um, the plastic tubing, but there still is some, a, a bit of maintenance involved with keeping it, keeping it going. And how many was that, I mean, reduced to four, but how many were hits were you getting of ter terrapins in years past? So it's hard to say. We've been monitoring since 2006. Uh -huh. and numbers we were getting with, so we've, this is our fourth version of fencing. Um, so with our, our, our first and second versions, we were still getting about 70 plus animals. So it's, it's reduced it, I think, quite a bit from even when we had the prior fencing. We only did a year of monitoring before we put up any fencing. And um, I can't off the top of my head tell you what that number was, right. but it was, not, it was not as intensive, monitor, the monitoring was not as intensive as it has been since we put up the, the barrier. Mm -hmm. so, we're trying to keep better track of the effort these days than we were in the beginning so we can match effort to, um, cause we, we can't always go out every day and check. Uh, we try to, but we, we, we can't <laughs> but the information that Brian gave us is, will be very helpful. Um, as far as when the optimal time to check, I, mean, I, I, know, I that kind of matched what I know in my gut, but it's, it's nice to have to see that, um, kind of line up with what I, what I see out there. Right. Nice. Thanks. Uh, sure. Megan from Department of Wildlife Resources, do you want to uh, talk about anything? No, I know you unmuted, but I'm not hearing anything. Huh. 
Is anyone else hearing her? I'm not hearing. No. I don't know what your microphone is doing. I'm looking. I don't know. Hey, I can I can throw one quick thing I forgot to sure. mention. Um, so we did also try an experimental um, patch of sand. We rototilled it up uh, where we where we think most of the the terrapins are coming out of the sand, uh, out of the marsh under the sand, and we put cameras on it, but we didn't get any any of them using it. Ah. So uh, we did try it. Um, we also do one other concern we do have with this barrier is it is funneling raccoons. Mm. Um, we are doing predator management, but we're not getting every raccoon. So that's, that's a concern with the barrier as well. Yeah. Randy, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, <laughs> I don't know what was going on. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot as a small update or, or just kind of mention of what we're doing here at the Department of Wildlife Resources. Um, yep. You know, honestly, I'm pretty new to the department. I've, I've worked here for about a year and a half now. I came up from the southeast where I did a lot of terrapin work, so I'm just kind of adjusting to mid-Atlantic life. <laughs> right. um, and of course, J.D., our state herpetologist, can't be here today. He's the one who'd probably be the most appropriate person here. Um, <laughs> But, you know, terrapins in Virginia, they're a tier two species of greatest conservation need in our wildlife action plan. And um, JD and I are, are both really, really interested in, in ramping up our efforts related to terrapins, um, just because it, it's something that, you know, they've always kind of been on our radar, but we have one herpetologist. So there, there's lots of species that need help here in Virginia, um, but, but we're starting to, to do more with them. One thing that we've done this past year that I'm super excited about, um, our agency actually has a, a membership initiative that's called Restore the Wild. It was developed about just a couple years ago, and it's a way for like non-consumptive wildlife recreationists, so photographers, viewers, et cetera, um, to get access to our public lands and contribute funds to the agency and basically have a voice in, in how we're managing for, for species especially those non-game species, which is something they've wanted for a long time. Um, and so every year with Restore the Wild, we select a species or a group of species to be the ambassador animals for the year that, that we use in our promotional work. We do artwork contests. And then um, all of the funds that we raise from Restore the Wild at the end of the year, we have an internal grant program that where biologists, our lands and access staff can, uh, can submit projects for to receive funding to increase habitat or, or conservation efforts for those species. And this year, our, our species uh, were Virginia's imperiled turtles. So we have had lots of stuff come in related to terrapins, which has been so exciting. Um, this was the most popular year for our artwork contest ever. It, it actually received more submissions than our state duck stamp, which was really exciting. So we now have a whole suite of really cool terrapin artwork we get to use for promotional and, and educational stuff. And um, nice. we've got several thousands of dollars that are, are getting ready to be advertised to our staff members here so that we can all start um, writing our, our grants. And I have several ideas that I will be submitting for grants to increase um, uh, some of our terrapin management work here in Virginia. So that's going to be great for us. And then the other big thing, of, of course, that you know about, Randy, uh, is that the RCN money, um, I don't Scott know. Scott was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I, I, maybe I guess I'll just save that, but, but I'm, I'm going to be involved with that a little bit and, and especially developing a statewide citizen science project for, for Terrapins um, within a similar framework to how NAMP used to be. You know, people will get loops and they'll survey them three times a year. So I'm really, really excited ab about that. Um, I think that, and I think that's really it for us here in Virginia for now. Like I said, I'm sure JD would have more to add, but that's at least what I've got going on. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. So that's from the management side. Does anyone want to add anything before we uh, circle back around to Scott and talk about a regional conservation network? John, you have something? No, no. I, no. All right. Nobody does it. It'd be good to get into the RCN a little. Hearing none. Scott, I think you're back up again. Okay. Well, um, so uh, I was actually up late, late last night finishing this final draft uh, a grant proposal, which is being looked at today 
in a meeting of the uh, uh, Northeastern Wildlife Diversity Technical Committee. And um, it sounds like they have um, uh, mostly decided, I think it's going to be 100% decided after today, to um, promote our proposal to go to the directors and the directors of the Northeast states uh, will make the final decision. But it's basically um, going to be a, a $200,000 of federal money uh, plus a 35% match. Um, actually, let me go back a little bit. So RCN, these, these uh, regional conservation need grants, the Northeast states all decided quite a few years back to put in 4% of their allotment uh, of this federal, uh, these federal dollars into a pool that would be used for uh, conservation projects for, um, for um, SGCN species in this region. Um, and um, for instance, there's, there's an ongoing uh, turtle uh, uh, project going on that includes uh, box turtles, spotted turtles. Um, I know Brian Zarati could probably jump in here and tell me, say a few more. There's a, uh, a project going on for um, pollinators um, that uh, one, of our, one of our staff, our staff entomologists is heavily involved with. So it's really funded some really great work. So anyways, uh, this project is gonna have a number of parts. Um, the first part of it is gonna be um, trying to get every state that has terrapins in the region to be collecting data the same way, using the same methodology for headcount surveys, whether they're land-based surveys or water-based surveys. I mean, it would be a different methodology for each of those two types of surveys. And all that data go to uh, one central place and, uh, be, um, be used to model for both um, state by state uh, terrapin concent concentration areas, but also to model a regional um, terrapin uh, conservation network or conservation area network to really help us identify what are the most important areas um, in, in, the, in, in this mid-Atlantic and Northeast um, region uh, for terrapin conservation. And so, um, that's part of the RCN. There's more parts. And so that part of it, uh, we would be basically uh, putting out a, a, a request for proposals for someone who's really going to be more of a, a, a tech person who's going to put together uh, some type of a um, uh, of a, a web portal, a secure web portal where citizen scientists can collect data and enter it in there um, uh, that the uh, whoever ends up uh, be, you know, getting that contract would also quality control that data, um, pull it into GIS databases, do all the modeling, uh, produce maps, produce final reports, and, and, a, and a publication or two out of it. Um, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is kind of um, along what Sean Ster uh, started us out with is uh, drone surveys. Um, there's a really huge uh, potential of these drone surveys uh, particularly if, if we can get them to the point where the methodology could be used by um, citizen scientists. Again, there are a lot of people out there, the general public, who own drones. And if you think about the possibilities to, um, uh, uh, for having them collect useful data for us on terrapins, uh, and of course also states and NGOs and things collecting data through drones, um, it's really... Um, you know, really opens the door to a lot of things if we can figure out some methodologies uh, that that can be done, um, that can be applied over over a long area. And uh, of course, Sean ha Sean has uh, told us about some of the difficulties um, encountered with do with doing this. But um, we are going to part of part of this RCN is going to be putting out um, a, um, a a call for proposals. Uh, to hire uh, one one person in one state, um, it'll, uh, they really it doesn't matter what state it is, but they're really going to have to uh, do a lot of testing of uh, what is the best way to do these, what's the best methodology, um, how to overcome some of the problems that Sean has already uh, talked about. Um, so that's that's the other part of it. And then the then the um, the second job is is research on the spatial ecology of terrapins. As you know, there hasn't been that many published studies. Of spatial ecology terrapins because of some of the issues uh, with the saltwater environment and some of the tech technological issues and the expense of uh, some of the more higher end 
uh, transmitter types. Um, it really becomes a, a cost problem. So we're we're uh, trying to um, we're trying to get um, the uh, leverage some money, and in this case, it would be a, a, um, $120,000 or $60,000 for two different projects, one um, in two different states, and those states would be defined by uh, basically the bidding process to um, uh, to uh, do some really uh, heavy duty uh, multiple year. Um, spatial ecology movement studies, looking at everything from nesting to overwintering um, with, with some fairly large sample sizes. And so, um, you know, that is the other part of this. So there's certainly people on this call who uh, might want to consider um, looking for those RFPs when they come out and, um, and, and putting in proposals. So there's going to be a team, a regional team of state biologists. Uh, most, of, uh, most of us are herpers or pretty much all of us are her people, uh, quite a few turtle people in there, including Brian and Nate who are on this call, um, who will be kind of the overarching committee um, looking at uh, these proposals and um, uh, helping, uh, helping kind of run the whole, the whole program, which is going to be from fiscal year 2023 through 2027. Uh, so it's uh, uh, counting the field parts of it and then uh, all the the laboratory and, and computer and statistical parts of it and, and modeling and, and report writing. Basically, it would end in 2027. That's when uh, things would need to be wrapped up. Um, I don't know if Brian or Nate um, would like to add anything to what I've just said. I mean, first and foremost, I just want to thank Scott for kind of shepherding, you know, us state folks to, to getting this done. Um, you know, the, the RCN this kind of last round of RCM proposals was in a bit of a limbo state. And we, we kind of heard last minute that there was an opportunity to kind of reduce funding from our um, original proposal and, and try to move something forward. So I want to say thanks to Scott for doing that. And just to kind of provide like a real like broad overview of kind of what this means, um, you know, if, if and when this is funded, you know, we've got six um, Northeast uh, regional species of greatest conserva conservation need that are turtles, um, bog, spotted, wood, box, you know, blandings and, and terrapins. And, you know, most of those other turtle species have received a significant amount of, of, of funding that's kind of derived through state wildlife grant, uh, competitive state wildlife grants, or, you know, kind of previous RCNs. And so it's really good to see, you know, terrapin, um, getting some of this uh, potential funding. And, you know, what we've talked about at the state level is also, you know, using this RCN as kind of a gateway to hopefully a future, um, you know, region, regional competitive SWIG grant, which could feed off of results from this, um, expand some other, you know, kind of priorities that we couldn't kind of cram into this budget, uh, you know, like illegal collection, you know, other, um, you know, other topics that we had to trim from this proposal. But it's really exciting, and you know, yeah, like Scott said, I hope, I hope we um, hear back very soon and and get some money out the door. All right, all right, we can uh, throw it open. Does anyone else have any other comments, observations, questions? I've got one if, sure. uh, if I can. Yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty fascinated as my talk earlier about drones brought up. Um, I'm really curious about seasonal aggregations of, of terrapins and uh, it's something that I haven't seen much work on. Uh, these seasonal aggregations are places, they're kind of staging areas, as I understand for, for uh, both male and female, both for, um, a courtship mating and then potential nesting from females. And if anybody has any information out there about the, um, how, uh, how broad or how not broad these aggregations are, I'd be really curious about 
uh, maybe contacting me or let me know here if you if you have any information about it. I've heard about it from several places. The only places that I'm aware of of it happening are, are from Cape Cod, just because of where I've I've uh, been to do that. But if anybody has any information, I'd love to to hear about that. Sean, we've seen that in Maryland um, with our headcount surveys. I mean, in fact, some of a lot of the timing of the headcount surveys when we first started them back in 2011 was to try to capture that because we see in a lot of sheltered coves. You see these large aggregations of, um, of terrapins and they're mixed sex. And, you know, there's obviously some, some mating going on. Um, you know, the, the question is, do they also overwinter in those areas? I mean, uh, these are often sheltered coves. So are we just catching animals that are just coming up from, from hibernation or, um, or, or are they, you know, or, or are they these pre-nesting uh, courtship and mating areas? And, um, but, you know, large, large concentrations, 50 plus turtles, all, you know, in a, in a small cove, um, usually sheltered, often south facing. Um, and we've seen this in both the Chesapeake Bay and the coastal bays. Yeah, and I had that picture that Alex Wilkie took. Alex, you want to say where you, that picture was taken? Yeah, thanks, Randy. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm out on the, the coasts on the eastern shore of Virginia. Um, I'm really a bird person, but... Um, <laughs> All the sites that I manage are barrier island sites, and we have, um, I mean, in my mind, a ton of nesting terrapins. I don't, you know, I don't have much to compare it to, but that picture was taken um, on the backside, and, and these are all very remote barriers, uh, no vehicle access, very different from other areas along the Atlantic coast, but that picture was taken along the backside of one of the islands on sort of the, you know, the um, creeks that, that run along those marsh edges. And I mean, that, that was a good picture. You know, usually they flush before I get that close to, a, to them, but I will say in certain sites out here, it, that's not unusual to see, you know, that number of, um, animals and, um, and they are, you know, just anecdotally, at the peak of the nesting season, they're really widespread on a lot of the barriers. Um, I think the, the substrate does probably make a difference. Some of our islands are really shelly um, and it doesn't seem like they can really get into that shell, but at certain sites, it's, it's, uh, it, it seems to be really good habitat. So um, that's where that picture, that was Matompkin Island, sort of up just south of uh, Nassau Wallops. Um, and I will mention just real quick that uh, and Pam said something about this because she's in, she's out here on the islands too, but, you know, overall on the islands, a, a lot of the management that we do that's bird focused is, is also benefiting the terrapin. So we do sort of widespread um, mammalian predator management. And then I think all of our human disturbance manager management in the context of people is, is helping the terrapins too. Um, and I'm going to put a link in the chat. Uh, there's a, I, I'm, there's so many parallels that I've heard today between the terrapin world and the bird world, because I'm not usually listening to the terrapin world, but there's a um, report from Virginia Tech about uh, human disturbance and sort of best practices and effective messaging and signage and volunteers. And there, there might be some information in that document that this group is interested in. So I'll provide that. Great. Thanks. And the flip side of the overlap between birds and terrapins is that if you use something like a drone to look for terrapins, you might be disturbing birds. And so you have to weigh that too, I think. And yeah, Randy, I'm glad, yeah. sorry, I meant to mention that because someone had put that in the chat. Right. So we've experimented here and there on the islands with using drones for doing like, you know, colony nest counts and monitoring birds. And um, that's a huge concern. And, you know, in places like this, where it's so overlapped with the bird habitat, um, as you're thinking sort of bigger across the, the, um, the terrapin range um, and, and the overlap of the timing of their nesting seasons, that could, you know, that could be a limiting factor, especially if, if some of the lower altitudes are what you need to detect what you wanna see. And there's several, there's several papers out there that talk about that um, potential problem. And I think it should always be a, I think it's, I think it's on us to, to always be cognizant of that concern. I think a couple things are that have come out or the angle of approach to a place where you're going to do drone work impacts birds much more. And 
Um, I saw the the comment in the chats earlier. I didn't respond to it, but I think if we're doing drone work, it's 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 definitely on us to be ethical about that, obviously, and 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 trying to make sure we uh, decrease, minimize um, that impact uh, all the time. So. Um, I can get a second. This is Lisa Ferguson at the wetlands. Hey, um, and Sean, I was going to let you know, um, we've been, you know, the um, aggregations and the questions of timing of that too has been an interest of mine, particularly in the Delaware Bay and trying to understand that. We got started with a small project. Um, one of our interns trying to use that headcount methodology on the beaches of the Delaware Bay to look at that this um, summer season, later in the nesting stages, but also being kind of a person who merges between terrapins and a lot of bird studies. Um, I'm out there a lot um, for shorebird migration um, in the spring and then later in the season. And I can tell you it's it's thick with aggregations, um, breeding concentrations and aggregations um, all up and down the Delaware Bay. Um, but then also we were picking up on a lot of the um, aggregations as females were concentrating to come up to breed. So in that real um, near shore, shallow water. Um, so seeing concentrations that continued um, through the nesting season and then moved closer to the creek, the creek mouths um, as we got later past, like as the um, tail end of the nesting season. So you could kind of pick up just by doing those um, point counts, those changes in the habitat use along the, the near shore waters. Um, I'm interested in doing that too, just to look at the overlap with the crab um, threat, the crab industry, and where we're seeing terrapin habitat use overlap with the number of crab traps that are out on the Delaware Bay. We have a significant number of drowned crab, uh, terrapins that are found on the Delaware Bay beaches. Um, we're picking those up through actually horseshoe crab um, volunteers um, that are helping us to identify and count and enumerate those. Um, we're using, the last few years, I've been using individual characteristics of the, um, the shells, to kind of getting to that aspect of it too, to identify individuals and use that as a mark recapture method um, to kind of slate those out and have a better understanding of how many um, terrapins we're using, uh, losing. But, there, uh, but all of that, you know, really needs to be um, founded in how, uh, what are, estimates of the population, basically distribution in the Delaware Bay. So I'm real interested in implying and, and talking to you about your experience up in, I think, Wellf, uh, Wellfleet Bay, Cape Cod Bay, and um, and some of that overlap with Delaware Bay, big need there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say real quick that most of my experiences are very tangential to a student I worked with, uh, Patty Lavasser, who's mm -hmm. uh, now, a, now a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts. She did, she's still doing a lot of work out there. So I I overlapped with her, served on her, served on her committee, um, things like that. But the contact person would definitely be Patty. She's very knowledgeable about that. One thing I will say, and thank you, Lisa and Alex, for that feedback. Um, Scott mentioned something earlier about um, protected, the protection of the, like the, where, the, kind of an ecological question about where you find these aggregations. And that's what Patty's found as well in Cape Cod, and especially in Wellfleet Bay very protected coves that are, um, you know, protected from wind, um, uh, kind of everything else. So, so it's, I think I'm curious about if we're finding these aggregations in particular places across the landscape, or if, uh, if they're more widespread, um, but yeah, thanks everybody for your feedback on this. Yeah. I really think from a conservation standpoint, those aggregation areas are critical. Um, and I think they need to be identified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd have to start defining what an aggregation is. And um, yeah, we could, I think that's, I think that's something I, I agree completely. I think those are, those are good spots. The, the turtles are picking them for a particular reason. And uh, so protection, um, nesting opportunities, for whatever reason, they're, they're coming together in those spots. Yeah, there are hot spots for terrapin conservation. I think there are also hot spot or cold spots for terrapin restoration that, that are areas that have, you know, have all the habitat requirements for a terrapin, but they're not there because there are 100,000 crab pots out in the water or something like that. So uh, I'd really like to see sometime in our lifetimes, well, mine's shorter than many of you, <laughs> uh, uh, actually see some place where terrapin conservation efforts have been put in and the population 
is restored itself somehow. So that, that would be a neat thing. I, I have a question about um, bycatch. Is anyone working on bycatch other than crab pots? Are, are you thinking about uh, bike nets and things? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there I... would be a, an overlap with anyone that's also researching birds because fike nets are, uh, well, they're fished differently than I think a lot of people realize. Um, they're fished at a much deeper level in, in the Chesapeake and they're usually for white perch harvesting. So if there's anyone that's looking for a project, I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, I don't know anyone that's, that's, I've seen some of the depressing pictures of turtles being trapped in fight nets, but I have not seen any research done on that. Right, just, yeah. I've seen abandoned traps, that's all I've seen. <laughs> right, well, I think that's, that could be a, a, a big source of mortality that we're overlooking. And I think that the, the photographs, I, I don't know what photographs you're talking about, but we had posted some from 2006, I think, and that was, at the mouth of the Chester River in, in the Chesapeake. Um, so, and, and they're usually set in nine feet of water, eight, nine feet of water. Mm -hmm. And those nets were, became visible because they were so full. Of dead um, bloated turtles. Yeah, so yeah. it's very unfortunate. I, I'm just surprised it's, it's, a, it's a gear that most researchers use but I don't, I can't find any bycatch information on it. And if someone is researching birds in a tidewater area, I think the two would, it would definitely be worthy of uh, some backing from terrapin enthusiasts as well as bird people. Um, and I, I've since requested um, just depredation photographs of between birds and terrapins, birds with turtles, that sort of thing, because there is just such a strong connection there. Yep. So if anyone would be interested in pursuing that, I, I'd like to help you get some funding on that. I think the challenge with the, uh, with the fight net is that it's very specific, you know, where the crab pot recreational crab pots are, you know, I, I would say easy, easily accessible. People fish them all the time. Fike nets, because they're regulated and they're so specific and are usually, you know, a licensed entity that does that. And, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, complications when it comes to, to, to checking, you know, what, whatever's captured or whatever, if they're, if they're a marine debris item, that's a whole other story. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm looking at it from like a, you know, Barnicket Bay, New Jersey standpoint where, you know, maybe that fishery isn't as, you know, prevalent as, you know, some other, you know, methods that they're using out there. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it, that, you know, it, it's going to change from state to state, but in Maryland, you, I think we do have it identified per gear and a lot, there is a lot of, uh, fike net fishing in the in uh, the shallow tributaries based on the, the data, uh, the fisheries data. Right. So it could be one fight net could wipe out 200 right. turtles. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And there was an incident uh, on the New Jersey coast a couple years ago, several years ago, and a bunch of them washed up, or you know, maybe it was Long Island, but, um, I had suggested that they pursue if there are any fight nets in that area. And um, it's definitely a gear that they use in that area. Whether they were there, nobody knows. It, I, I have known of situations where they would get lost in the, over the winter when they're fishing for white perch, for example, and they got iced out or whatever and they weren't able to get it. And then in the spring, they come back to get it. And um, that's when they would be discovered to be full with terrapins. And that was a technique for harvesting terrapins mm -hmm. as well. Right. All right. Well, we're at the uh, top of the hour, which is the witching hour for us. We all turn into weekend pumpkins uh, at noon. So, um, John, do you have any other closing comments that you'd like to make? No, thanks to all the presenters and everybody for sharing today. Um, it was great to hear 
you know, uh, some of the, not only research, but conservation methods and updates from the state. So it was great to get together and, and talk. Gives me a lot more to think about. Thank you. Yeah, I'll iterate all of that and thank John for uh, coordinating these sessions and for bringing so many of the uh, student researchers to the talks and, and presenting here today. And thanks to Randy for, for really putting this together. And, <laughs> and all right, well, uh, depressingly, you all have to keep your masks on and keep your shots updated. And uh, hope you all have a great weekend. And uh, like I said, I made a recording of this. So if anybody wants to get that, uh, I'll, I can make that available as needed. Thanks, all. Thanks. Take care. Stay well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. All right, John, that was great. I, I think we had, I think at the, at the peak, we had something like 44 yeah. at, attendees, which is great because I think we had 49 registered. So yeah, almost everybody. Yeah, I saw it was like almost near what, what you said you had a number. So nice, nice job, Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Everything went well. The talks were perfect, you know, in terms yeah. of like the timing and everything. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Thane, thanks for uh, attending. All right. Thank Please. you. All right. Stay well, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Randy. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.